everyone, we are live, all the devices are on silent. We've just been through the icebreaker and we have got Mr. Lee West hey. in the studio. Good to be here. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> it took Man. me about three hours to set everything up, but we got that in the end, didn't we? <laughs> and that was after the three hours you didn't see me set up. Yeah, yeah. Um, right. First off, no, oh, Copper Bar. Cracking place. Yeah. Like, generally. Love that place. Yeah. I haven't been there for a little while. Mm. But uh, it is a memorable establishment. Yeah. It's up the top of the steps. Up the top of the steps. It's right by... It, behind it is Laser Quest, right? Laser Quest. Used to be Laser Quest. Yeah, yeah, it's a good spot. cinema, the yeah, castle spot. cinema. Yeah, it's a good spot. Mm. Like it. Anyway, we were going to cover a bit of a topic from the icebreaker. <laughs> right. Straight in, yeah. The, the running with Al-Qaeda. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Talk, th talk through that again from the top. Right. So... If you want to go right back, add a bit of substance to how that came about. <laughs> Baghdad, 2006, and we're on uh, operations in Baghdad in American uniforms, driving around in American Humvees. It's um, your high value target operations, so we're not patrolling or stagging on or um, bunker positions or anything like that. It's high value targets as soon as they come in. We either got a Humvee if it's urban, or getting helicopters if it's rural. During so it's nighttime operations. We'd be then we'd get back in maybe four, five, six in the morning, get our heads down for a bit, turn to about eleven midday for a briefing. So during this period, and then we'd have the day to prep and get everything ready for the next night's operations. Myself and a paratrooper Mark, uh, who later when he left the paras came to live with me in Swansea. Best muckers and everything, yeah. And we became good, good muckers on the on the build up to that tour, and then when we got out there, which defeating the status quo of Paris and Marines not getting along, rubbish. And he was the trauma medic for the for the troop, a troop of Marines with one para as the uh, trauma medic. But we got in great, and they got a hospital complex in Baghdad and the unit in place was the 28th, ca uh, 28th Cash and they called the hospital The Cash, CSH, Combat Support Hospital. So during the day when we were on ops, we'd get up a little bit earlier, me and Mark, a little sacrifice for the benefit of then going down the hospital to help out slash flirt with the American nurses, <laughs> drink all their <laughs> welfare coffee with French vanilla and have all the perks of that. So we'd go down and help out, chat with the nurses a lot of the time. And yeah, he would get to do, get a bit of hands-on. I'd be able to watch as well and see it right. Hands on the nurses and he'd watch. Hands on the nurses, up. yeah, be watching, yeah, we're all into that. <laughs> that, sounded, that sounded like you're in a bit of cuckold in there, yeah. <laughs> if it's one pad of mortars, it'd have been hands-on with the male nurses. Um, so that would be a routine. We'd go down. We Once inside the green zone, part of Baghdad, uh, we'd have civilian clothing on. We'd sign out a civilian car from... MT, carrying pistols only, SIGs. Then we drive down to the hospital, do whatever we need to do, and then drive back to our little enclave. So this was the routine, and we'd had, we'd had an intelligence briefing a few days before this fateful day. Well, it wasn't fateful in, in the end, but this memorable day, that they were going to plan to snatch a Westerner from the green zone, Al-Qaeda, Iraq. Plan to snatch a Westerner from the green zone, it was between the 26th and the 28th of September, this day being the 27th. But we did that briefing and didn't really think anything of it. Okay, they're going to get a contract. There are lots of them hanging around Westerners inside the Green Zone officials. On this day, we'd, we'd left it a bit too late than we normally liked. It was dusk, so it was getting dark. And there was only two routes back from the hospital to our, to our base. So you couldn't throw much deception in. And we'd left got in the car, started driving back. As we approached this roundabout, Mark could see like a commotion up ahead. Four guys with AK-47s had come out and stopped, stopped all the traffic. So we're looking now, obviously it's dusk now, so the visit isn't that good. Looking ahead, thinking, well, what's going on here? Is it, uh, is, is it been an incident? And now the security, the contractors or the, or the Iraqi police are coming out and taking control of it. And then we looked a bit closer. They had no IDs, no uniforms. They're just like in black pajamas and stuff like that. Which in the green zone, if you're carrying a weapon and you're not a, a uniform force, you need some sort of identifying feature to show people that you're allowed to be carrying weapons in the green zone. So alarm bells sort of started to go. 
to Mark's like, I think it's a snatch. I think it's a snatch attempt. They're stopping the traffic to snatch someone. And there was two different emotions getting played out in front of this car, which turned out afterwards to really work well for the situation we were in. Because neither of us had been in anything ever like that before. And I liken it to when you always think throughout your life, if I saw a car crash with horrendous injuries, I would act a certain way. If I was in the middle of a bank robbery and a granny got grabbed, I would act this way. Somebody burgled my house. And you'll go through life thinking that, but until it happens, you will never know how you will personally naturally react to it. And there was a moment when I had an AK-47 then pointed at me. I thought I might have liked to have gone through life without knowing this part of me. But that wasn't an option. I was going to find out. Because as we were trying to assess it from the right of us, there was some woodland. A lone guy walked out straight across our front, turned and just pointed his rifle straight at our windscreen. So now they're like, well, we're no under no illusions now. They, they hear to, for us, he's pointed the AK straight at us. <clears throat> so Mark was hasty. As in, he was trying to get the mobile phone out. Did, did they have, in, did they have in, in or something suggesting that there was a couple of foreigners out? Yeah, there? and we obviously, when after this event, we're all interrogating it. I go, well, how? Okay, how did yeah. they identify us? Okay, how yeah. would they know who we were? Yeah, yeah. And we, we we backtracked and went, well, well, let's work out how. We can come on to that if you want. Yeah. Yeah. But sorry. Um, yeah. So at this point, he's going. I'm going to put my foot down. I'm just going to go through him, and then I'll J turn it out of here. He's trying to get the mobile phone out to get the QRF. We, we got the guys um, from Hereford out there in the base and some of our guys as well on QRF for something like this. No signal on the phone. So we're like, all right, well, it's just us. And he's going, I'm going to put my foot down. So I'm going, well, don't put your foot down because he definitely is going to open fire then. At the minute, he isn't. And like, I'm talking about this in slow time now, but this is all happening a thousand miles an hour. You, you're assessing it. You go, well, he would... And looking back on it as well, going, if he, if he was here to shoot us, he would have killed us now. He would have just got it over with. So he isn't here to just shoot us through the windscreen. So a bit of a... How close is he? Just in front of the bonnet. So oh, you can see then you're westerners. Oh, yeah. You can see. Yeah, yeah. So he's he's, like, yeah. No he's walked out in between because the traffic's now slowed down because right. the roundabout's come to a standstill. So we're sort of sh sh um, shuffling up to the next one, and he's walked out in between the car in front of us and us and turned the point at us. So there's, there's no mistake at this point yeah, that yeah. he's there for us, and they knew what car we were in. So the decision is now, what are we going to do? And Mark was like, yeah, yeah, we need to do this. And we, we, we've both joked about this ever since. Me and Mark, he's like gives me grief saying, oh, you... You didn't know what was going on. You were too, you were too like blase, just like didn't, you were, you mean too hesitant because you were just like bluffing. Oh, yeah, whatever, chilled out. And me, it might have been a little bit of that where, where I was just like, well, too not quick enough to get to instigate some sort of action. But as I later found out in other situations, a little bit different to that, but of equal danger, that is my natural thing is to just go. For in a split second, what is going on here first before I do something. And that's what was getting played out. And it turned out to be the right um, combination. He was hasty. I was like, well, is it actual a snatch attempt? Is he an actual terrorist? And I was like, yes, he is. <laughs> okay, then, all right. Well, let's do something then. But let's not just put our foot down. So quick conflab about that in the car. Um, so at this point, like, well, what's the options? We can try and J turn out, but we can't because the cars are now shuffling up behind us as well. We could go through him. It's a bit of a distance, 100 meters or so from the roundabout where the other guys are. We are in range, but there's a bit of distance. Or what we decided to do was, let's just go along with it for now until we can come up with what we're going to do. Because putting a foot down, I don't think was an option. So the options were, I established at this point as well, that he was the sprog. They'd sent the sprog because this the, was the most unenviable task because he was the, the, the most likely to get shot by us. Um, I'm carrying my pistol sort of between my legs and so got it out below the dashboard so that he couldn't see my hands, cocked it. And again, it's like he was inexperienced because 
looking back now as well, he should have put got us to put our hands on the dashboard or show them at least, and he didn't. So we managed to cock our pistols. So the other option is, I said to Mark, well, just pull forward a little bit. Mark did pull forward a little bit. I said, well, we could do him now out through the side window and then take action. But again, it, and like I said, I'm talking about slow time now. This was all happening very quick. And I think it was, we decided that that wasn't the best option. We did need a little bit more time to work out what was going on and how we're going to get out of it. So the guy starts pointing, we're sort of motioning as if like acting dumb. We don't know what you want, mate, what do you want? So he's pointing towards what was just up ahead was a gate to go out into the red zone, Greater Baghdad, the Wild West. So he's pointing at us to go towards that. So Mark's saying he wants us to go out the gate into the red zone and I ain't going out. I was like, no, we're not. But let's just go with it for now and then put a bit of distance between us and him and then we can get out of the car and then see what's going on. So we pulled forward a bit to the roundabout, pulled off to the side as if we were going to go out of the gate. And then we were like, right now, both jumped out of the car, both came round to my side and the gunman had now come round the opposite side. So we had the car in between us, drew our pistols and we we're like, right, well, now we're going to do something. And there was woodland behind us. So we're like, well, we can drop him now and leg it into the woodland. Um, Guys on the roundabout are sort of looking around going, what's going on? Because we've cat amongst the pigeons now. They weren't expecting us to get out of the car and do this. The Sprog's getting a bit anxious. He's sort of like shaking a little bit, looking back to the other guys for direction on what to do. They must have thought you were Civ Pop. They must, did they think you were journalists or something like that? Or aid workers or something? No. Did and not be expecting that this, Yeah, this is... We'll cover it then of okay. why, why right, we yeah. did think right, yeah. okay. um, they knew it was us. Every day when we went into that hospital, you had two um, sets of security. The outer one, or well, the inner one, is US troops. And you have to go up to them, unload whatever weapon you're carrying, show them ID, and go into the hospital. But before them, there's third country, third party troops from like Sri Lanka and Africa and places like that, just in their beige uniforms. They got no allegiance to anyone. So, of course, every day we're going to the hospital, we, weren't, we didn't have beards or anything, but we, we, we didn't have to clean shave every day. We went in civvies. We're concealed pistols because we'd have them hidden. So, of course, when we get to this gate with these foreign guards and the US troops, we then pull a pistol out to unload it. We then pull out two ID cards, one saying British Army, one saying Royal Navy. So these security guards are going, well, who are these two guys? Because they ain't got uniforms on, but they've got IDs. The hair's a little bit longer. Um... And we're going there every day, showing them ID, same routine, roughly the same time of day we're going there, parking out the front in the same car, and leaving roughly at the same time. So that what we assessed was how they they clocked us weeks before, probably. Do you regret anything about those, uh, <laughs> that routine? Well, like I said, it's it a danger. It turned out to be the dangerous liaison, didn't it, going to meet those nurses, because it ended up with us nearly getting nabbed. Yeah. And So you've pulled over, you've popped out of the car, you got your pistols out, the, yeah. the Joe bag, the new bloke's having a flap. He's having a full-on flap. And he's looking for direction. From yeah, the he's shouting to the other guys. They're shouting something back as well. And they're, they're, they've lost control of it to what they wanted. It wasn't going perfectly. So now they've got to reassess and do something else. They pulled over a Land Cruiser with two American ladies in. So he must have thought, well, these two ain't playing ball, but we need to get someone while we're here. So pulled over two ladies. They're trying to get. He's trying to tell them to get out, of, uh, to go out of the green zone, the gate, uh, into the red zone. So they start calling over to us. So we say to them, "Don't go out of the red zone, ladies. We're British forces, and we're going to try and help to resolve this situation." While this is getting played out, Mark's like, "We're going to have to shoot him and try and get out of here." And then a bizarre moment happened. This, like an anticlimax to the story, but. I think a part of me does wish we'd started shooting because it would be a better story if we'd managed to get away as well. But this was the best resolution all around, was an American convoy turned up so they met at the roundabout and the cheeky bastard stopped the American convoy, these guys with the AKs on the roundabout. And you can hear them on the tannoy then going, we are the American forces, get out of the way, we will open fire. And then they start swearing at them as well then. And... He, so I'm like to Mark, right, well, we're not going to start shooting now because we were probably going to lose against four AK-47s, five, 
we're definitely going to lose against 50 cals on Humvees and MRAPs and oh, they Strikers. Up, they? Oh, yeah. And yeah. the, the Yanks, are, they don't know who we are. Or they don't care. And they don't care is the, the main part of that. <laughs> Two guys, we're in civvies, shooting to, in their direction. You, they're getting, we're getting dropped. So I was like, we're definitely going to lose now if we, if we start opening fire. And the Yanks threatened them. And then eventually these guys were like, we've missed our window now. We, we've been rumbled. And dropped their weapons, like dropped them, and ran out the gate. And the Iraqi police and an army on that checkpoint stood there and watched them. He's just like, we, we are here, like, helping you, and you've just facilitated that. You've obviously let them in, yeah. and you've just let them run out as well. Um, yeah, and it was just like the, we, the bizarre moment where we just both looked at each other and was like, let's get back for a scran then, shall we? And then just got back in the car and drove back like in a trance. And we got back to camp and we still didn't realize the severity of it. We got back to camp, went like straight to the troop sergeant and the lads on our side and told him it. And he was like, you just, they just tried to snatch you. Get to the ops room now. So straight up the ops room and, and obviously reported it. Cause we were just still like dazed by it. It was just mm. very quick that it happened and we just didn't have time to think. And then when it was all over, it was, it was just like a, what has actually just happened there? Um, yeah, so we're back to camp, reported it. Yeah, fucking hell. That was a bit of a lucky one. Yeah. Do you know what I think it is with the, with the police and, well, the, whether it be Iraqi forces, Afghan forces, probably Syrian forces do the same. Mm. Well, Syria's a bad example, actually. But um, where they just let things happen. I think mm -hmm. it's like two things. It's like a, a lack of understanding of the bigger picture mm. of what we're trying to do there. Yeah. And two, it's they don't want the hassle. Yeah. Terry Taliban or, or flipping Albi Al Qaeda mm. comes rocking up and goes, Hey, we're going to go in there and uh, we're going to set up an yeah. IBCP there. And if you fuck with us, we're going to, you know, it's not going to be good for you and yeah. your family. And you're going to go, Yeah, crack on. Yeah, they're still like, on the hassle. Yeah. And it gets to the point where they didn't even need to be threatened. Yeah. Al Qaeda or Taliban are just knocking about yeah. wherever and just doing what they want to do because they yeah. don't want the hassle. Because they know we'll be gone one, one day. Mm. Same as in Afghan, they know we'll be gone one day. The Taliban won't disappear and the Al, Al Qaeda won't disappear. All the people who are part of those organizations want. Like just long. Yeah, I, I summed that it's up in the easy life. Yeah, so that's n nailed on to how I summed up in a part of the book about how Afghan has ended up like it is, and how it was always going to is because when you look at it, that country, is when you have a terrorist organization, right? They're united by they fully believe in their mission, and they will if they've got the means to do it. There's no doubt about their ideology and the fact and their cause and their purpose. They're full on and that's what they want to do. And the problem you get with like a bit of the Iraqis, but definitely in Afghan, those ones in the middle, like you say, they they weren't fully invested in defeating the Taliban. Because a part of them is like, will it be that bad underneath them? Can I just get on with my life if the Taliban are here? We got we got the Brits and the Americans here now. I'm constantly in war do I really want to push it? And then, like you said, get the repercussions to the Taliban. And that's the problem is the Taliban know what they want and they will force it all the way. Whereas then you've got the people fighting the Taliban or the Afghan side of it. They don't. They're not fully united. There's so many war infractions and tribes in Afghan. They can't unite together. And within that, you have got the ones going, Is it? can I be asked, basically? And that is, and they're corrupt, obviously. It's whoever's paying them the most money it's, is it's where their allegiance even, lies. It's not even the thought of, will it be that bad of the Taliban? It's remembering it wasn't, it wasn't that bad of the Taliban. Yeah. Didn't that's it. It's like, going yeah. on. Yeah. Same like, as yeah. Do I, do I want to be fighting them all the time or, yeah. or should we just yeah. get on with them? There were 100% people in like Iraq mate, mm. who would have preferred it under Saddam, who mm. remember it and go, yeah. It weren't that bad then, actually. Yeah. At least there's a bit of order. Mm. You, we knew where we stood. I'm obviously, this is, mm. I'm assuming this. We no, knew where we my, stood. My, you know, my, you my mother's next door neighbor, bad. so our family home, he still lives there now, Leith, from Baghdad, Iraqi, settled in Wales years and years ago, so I've known him for, I mean, decades. And we still talk about it now, and he does, that's not just something we think they say. He does say that to me. He, he does say that under Saddam, we knew the score. All right, it did depend on who you talk to because there are factions who lived in Iraq there who did want him gone because their life wasn't like that. He was, luckily, when he was there on, he must have been Sunni. Um, 
he got left alone. But even though, yeah, he, he, you're not saying he had a perfect life there. That's what it, that's what the sentiment is. It's like, yeah, it weren't perfect, but at least there was law and order and you pretty much know where, knew where the line was. Um, so they do say that because, yeah. 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 It's a problem when you start thinking, I say it's not a problem. It's dangerous to ground to go down when you start thinking about things like that as a, as people who served in those places. Mm. You think, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What were we doing? Yeah. Why were we there? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's that question. Like, yeah, I did. I did a piece on BBC iPlayer for the twentieth anniversary last year for Iraq, and they they always want to say, "Was it worth it? Do you regret it? Was it a victory?" And like like loaded questions. But he said the the one is, "Was it worth it?" Well, you speak to somebody, some people from Iraq, like no, and it was hundred percent worth it. They've got a better life now, and they did want that. You talk to some other people, and it's the complete opposite. It was a disaster. They lost family and everything that they had. So there's no clear answer. There's nobody could turn around and go and say it was a complete mistake or it was a complete success. It's there's different people involved in it. And the mm -hmm. same with forces. I I treasure my tour of Iraq. Some blokes obviously don't. Um because of what happened after what maybe happened there to them and of course in the aftermath. Mm. Yeah. Would you um would you let any, I don't know if you've got kids or not, but would you let your kids join up? I got a daughter. She's American, so American mother, born in America, still lives there now. Was um, her mother a nurse? Hmm? Was her mother yeah. a nurse? <laughs> that would be the logical <laughs> thing to get from that, wouldn't it? Most people leave her. In fact, that's the first time somebody's asked me about it. Was it one of the nurses? Uh, the other one is because we used to go to Virginia Beach with, with the Marines training on exercise or whatever, and 29 Palms, I never went there, but Marines go there quite a lot. The next one is, is that from one of the trips over and like a night out, wild night out? I'm like, that would be one of the other logical reasons for it. It isn't. Um, it is a, it's a long, complicated story. Would you, you, let, her join which, up? Would you let your daughter join up? Um, I, don't, I honestly don't know, to be honest with you, because... Like we just talked about with the two sides of the coin. I assume you could stop her, but you know. Yeah, yeah. There's, and it'd be the US Marines as well, wouldn't it? Although she, she'll have dual citizenship, so I guess she would be allowed to join the Royal Marines, and females are allowed to apply. I still don't think one's passed, though, have they? There was the yeah, first okay, one yeah, was. You had females pass the. Command, they passed the commander the course, yeah. not, oh, you mean not Royal Marine unit. commando, like the full. Oh, the, oh, okay, right, start yeah, to yeah, finish. Yeah, yeah. I don't think. It was the first one. She was still there when I was in my last post, and she left then. She had hip injuries and stuff, and they kept her for like a couple of years, I think, and then eventually gone. I don't think one's actually passed out from day one, Royal Marine. They, they passed depot. the commander course. You mean definitely. Depot, depot? Yeah, as in oh, you go yeah. from Civvy, join day one, nod, crow yeah, training, yeah, yeah. and then get all the way t to the end. We've um, had one. So we've so yeah, same with us. We've had we had we've had one who passed P Company. Yeah, I know the but got P Company. Was all, it was yeah. the officer all arms P Company and mm. she went Sanders and that. So it's the same risk we're, we're waiting on. Yeah, that start to finish. A female yeah. join Depot Depot. Yeah, Depot day one. Yeah. Go through all of that. Pass P Company that way. Because it's really yeah. the same as you guys. It's, it's a fucking different kettle of fish. It's not the same oh, yeah. as, as officer no. route or transferring from another unit route. And this is not me and not, this is not me uh, putting down females here. This no. is the same well, it's obviously Anyone not. It's obviously not. Man or woman. It's, it's, it's mm. a harder route when you yeah. go the uh, depot way. But I think we're a long way off seeing that. Yeah. I think we're a long way off seeing that. Because, you know, the P Company and the and the Commando course, those in, in, in isolation are physically difficult, right? Mm. And mentally difficult. Yeah. Right? But that's, yeah. The whole depot piece, everything before that, like the hardest stuff I ever did was not P Company. The hardest mm. I ever did was before, in the build-up to mm. that, in the yeah. in depot, 100%. mentally the hardest stuff, some, and physically some of the hardest stuff in the build-up. The hardest stuff I physically ever did was after P Company. Mm. When I got the battalion, we did stuff mm. that was much harder, yeah. much harder regularly. And you go, what? P Company was a fucking doddle. Mm. You know, at the time, I had different, uni different units and different times had different experiences. It was, we had, we happened at one point, rather some lunatic RSM at one point couple of years but um again i think it's so far off it because mm. the whole package it just breaks you fucking down yeah break and I, I remember getting towards the end of training and just think feeling like the most unfittest person in the world because it's just constantly knackered 
he'd like break into a little trot and I'd just be like, my legs would be heavy and just be out of breath. And he's like, how can I be on the cusp of passing commando training? I just feel knackered all the time yeah. because that long process is designed to, like you said, the, stand, the tests as standalone tests, they're obviously hard, but any moderately fit person could turn up. You could take somebody in Civvy Street who's in, uh, to a certain fitness level, could turn up and do the endurance course and then the nine mile speed march and the Tarzan course and the 30 miler. But can they do them after getting smashed for 26 weeks beforehand, mentally and physically? Well, it's a different ball game. Though. Well, this is the thing with uh, SF selection as well, isn't it? Mm. If you can go as a civvy or yeah. the next minute, you can go down to Brecon and don't go and do your fan yeah, dance and get yeah. your little badge, yeah. get your little medal. Yeah, I've done with the SS yeah. too. Yeah. All right. <laughs> now, you know, you know, there's a reason. There's a, there's a reason the pass rate is so fucking small on those yeah. courses. But mm. the same reason the pass rate is so small on bootnecks and, and par edge mm. because it's ev- you got Before. if you've got to the point of being able to actually do this, the tests you know the fan dance whatever else on on selection you know mm. you, you're in week three of of the hills you there's a big element of luck there mm. there's a huge most of it is like preparation and fizz and mental uh, mental uh, strength but there is a big element of luck as well for mm. just not getting injured <laughs> yeah. You know what oh, I mean? Yeah. You're smashing yourself over yeah. that kind of terrain. That's just not getting yeah. injured. Not That's getting your more chance of getting injured than just failing it because you're not fit enough. It was Ironman Wales, wasn't it, last week, whatever it was. No, I know people who've done it in previous years as well. You know people well. And they've they've done an Ironman. And I can just look at them category and say, you wouldn't pass Depot <laughs> or Limston. <laughs> Do you mean? You could pass an Ironman. But you wouldn't get through training. And that's the thing is, it's like, yeah, you can be fit enough to pass an Ironman. That doesn't mean you can pass It's training. completely different experiences, isn't it? Like, um, uh, I probably couldn't do an Ironman. They'd be like, yeah, you could pass marine training. Yeah, you couldn't do an yeah, Ironman. Yeah. No, exactly, mate. Do you know, I, do you want to, when it's like, when I started playing rugby again, I had like, this is a random number, I had like five or six years off. And I was, no, longer than that, I had more than five or six years off because I kept popping my shoulder. Anyway, <coughs> I did, when I started getting back involved with rugby again, my the fit I was fit at the time, mm. but I wasn't rugby fit. I'd yeah. forgotten. Yeah. Even I wasn't sprint fit. I would do mm. a lot of running, you know, like three, four, five, six miles about that distance. Sometimes a lot longer, but not very often shorter. And I started sprint training. And I remember the first time I went out and did sprints, a sprint session. I could barely walk the next day. I could barely walk the next day because I was activating all these muscles. I thought, fuck it, that was fucking wild. <laughs> Same when I I, put, I dipped my toe into jujitsu for a few years. And the same when I, for, I was fit, mate. I was all over body fit. And when I ended my first jiu-jitsu session, I was spewing afterwards in the car park, mm. thinking, fucking hell. Just, yeah. You can be, like you said, you can be an Iron Man. Mm. Good, luck do, good luck going and doing some other... Go and go, good luck going and doing high rocks. Mm. You know what I mean? Or yeah. something, or something mm. like that. Yeah. You're just not going to be able to do it. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people don't realise it. Yeah. A lot of people don't realise yeah, it. It's a game, man. But, um, yeah, I think we're a long way off seeing a, a female go through depot yeah. anywhere. I don't, I don't think I'd like to see. It happens, you know, yeah, it yeah. But. Going back to my daughter, I don't think I'd like to see her. Probably because she's a girl, and that might be sexist of me. And she's my daughter, and obviously you want to protect her. And I've seen inside the military, and I mean, I've, I don't know if I, <laughs> you know what I mean. And I, I'm not just on about bagging off and stuff like that. I'm just like, I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't think I'd like her to live. It'd either make you or break you. Mm. It's the same. And it would also depend on her. I, I guess it'd be me looking at what she's like. If she's like 18 and she'd seem to be, th- that life would really suit her, I was like, you know what, it probably would be really great for her. But if I didn't think she was a good fit for it and it wasn't a good fit for her, then so I guess it would be, be uh, up to, this is not a, a black and white answer now. It'd be something that could change. My mind could change on it. Mm. Mm. So how did you end up going from um, Al Qaeda dodgy days to uh, running Copper Bar? So I got I did seventeen years and got medically discharged for hearing loss in twenty nineteen. So my hearing had been deteriorating for years, as a lot of people's had been, and of course it got to the point where the med centre were then saying right, it's now beyond the point you're going to get downgraded for your hearing. Well, it was. You can't go now near weapons. I was platoon weapons instructor. So you're like, well, that, that's that been my job forever, weapons and tactics. And 
you go into a med board, you go into the emboss, we call it. You go into the emboss and to see for a medical discharge. Within 17 years, I was color sergeant on the cusp of getting Sergeant Major as well, so that was coming. And I had to make a decision. And it was my head and heart were fighting every single day. Because the heart's saying, you want to stay. Of course you do. You've done this for 17 years. You've loved it, every, everything. And your head is going, well, you have, you have got to look after your, your health as well now. And you could go on and do something else. So it was coming down to where you go into the med board and there's so much support because what I was in my career is like I had so much experience, courses, qualifications. And of course, they don't want to pension you off because it probably costs them more money. They'd rather keep paying you and get something off you rather than keep paying you and you're not working for them. So there's a lot of support as in from higher officers going, so-and-so has been through this, similar situation to you. We got him through the med board and we got him to stay in service and get whatever job. But of course, whatever job would have been storeman, clerk, or something, and he used the term not kicking doors in, and there was a color sergeant, so I probably wasn't gonna be kicking doors in anyway, but a backseat job that I wouldn't have liked. So I had to make the decision, right, do I wanna push this and stay in service? So it was my call, do my, last five years and then retire on 22 or maybe extend as well or do i want to go out on a high because if you told me before i joined everything i did i wouldn't have believed you i'm like that's not possible every course you I mean jwick arctic para course tactical questioning we got all, all the ops all the trips the lot i so i was like i've done everything Apart from now promotion SAR major, which is going to come, I don't really have to do anything to achieve that. It'll just come by nature. I've, I've done everything I wanted and more. So why not now go out on a high, looking back fondly with great memories, rather than hanging around and then ended up maybe resenting it. And I'd, I'd, I'd already lined up buying the bar by this point before I went to the med board with one eye on coming out. So then I've got the bar back home in Swansea, but I'm on parade down in Plymouth. Oh, the staff are ringing me. The toilets are flooding or someone's kicking off and I'm stuck down in Plymouth. So did you not have a manager in place then? No. No. And so you were managing the bar while you were still serving? No. Uh, yeah. No, we did have a manager when I bought it um, until my, my med thing came through. Yeah, so we, we bought it in, well, I bought it and I brought my best friend in as joint director, because he'd owned a business before. I hadn't even worked in a bar or a coffee shop, let alone owned a business or <laughs> I hadn't even worked in the industry. I'd never owned a business and I'd never worked in the industry that I'd just bought a business in. Sounds like a good investment. Woo. Yeah. yeah <laughs> love bars, mate. Yeah, love beer, whatever. Mate. Love beer. Yeah, I yeah, know loads about bars. <laughs> what can go wrong? Fucking so nightmare, bought it? it. Yeah, bought it in August 2019. So you know what's coming, August from August oh, 2019 no. as well. Bought it August 2019. I was still serving, color sergeant. Uh, on the band, and I was like, then he played an instrument. I'm like, well, I could blow me on trumpet. Um, I was like, no, but before they play the instruments, they got to learn how to be a Marine of sorts. And then the med board was in the October. So we bought it in August with the staff already in place. Um, he quit in November once he realized that we weren't like the old owners who just let them do what they wanted. And I'm turning up there every day going, why hasn't that been done? Why are you doing this? Why is this happening? And he was like, the game's up here. We can't just loaf around every day. So he was off. He went to work in game. Remember game, the, yeah. like he went to be a sales assistant in game. So he's gone he from like a manager of a craft beer bar really? to be a sales assistant in game. I was like, that just shows you know, your level of motivation Jesus and Christ. aspirations. Um, How old so, was he? Early 20s, mid 20s. Well, fair play to him for being able to manage the, well, for ma being mm. the manager of it. Well, yeah. It doesn't sound like he was doing much managing, manager of it. Yeah, bluffing. That's what he just left that he exactly he could, He'd leveraged that and gone on and got something else in Swansea. Yeah. Really. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, we, we bought it in August and then the med board was in October. So I went to the med board and went, pretty much, I will, I agree that I should be discharged from <clears> service. And I had some dark times when COVID then did hit. And one of the things I really struggled with 
was my last day after that med board. Your last day in service? Yeah, right. not officially because you get all your terminal leave and resettlement and everything, but it was my last day. Of how it came about, it still to this day, it like stuns me and I, I still am really got to grips with it. So I went to the med board in Portsmouth, went in, yep, yeah, you are to be discharged from the Royal Marines, happy days. Go to the unit pay office tomorrow, back in Libston, hand this in, and then you get processed from there. So I went there, turned up the next day in civvies, went in, handed in to the, the female civilian behind the desk. And now I wasn't expecting some kind of fanfare when I left at all, but I wasn't expecting this. <laughs> I handed her the thing from the, from the med board and she handed me a sheet of paper back, an A4 sheet of paper and said, go and get all the stamps on there, hand it back in and then that's you. I went, what do you mean, that's me? She went, that's you, you can, you can go. I went, all right, don't I have to turn up on Monday and report? She went, never again. Get that stamped and leave camp. <laughs> and I was like, right. So I just walked out of the, the pay office with this piece of paper going, all I've got left to do in my career is get two stamps, hand this in and just leave, disappear forever. I don't know what I thought in my mind. I thought, I, well, I thought I was going to have to turn to a Monday. I'd speak to the education officer. I'd have to like keep checking in with them over yeah. while my resettlement was in place. They may want some stuff off me first, glean some knowledge off me. I don't know. I, but I would, yeah, I said, I wasn't expecting some fanfare or some in-depth thing, but I wasn't expecting there's a piece of paper, get lost. And not that even would, a leave in do nothing. Not even, did you get a testimonial? Um, I think I was I was um, entitled to a top table dinner, but of course COVID hit. So oh I think I still God. am entitled to it now. But I'm just like, do I really want to go now crawling back to me and go, well, I can I have my top table now? But I think because it was, I would have, they like, oh, well, you would have done your 22 mm. years as a senior, because I was. You are entitled to one because your career has been ended short for a, a, a military disability. It's been forced on you. Um, so it was nothing. It, I just handed in a respirator and a helmet which is all you got to hand in now. He's none, none of the rest of your kit, just a helmet and a respirator. And it was funny, any helmet or respirator. So it was like my helmet from being a recruit. I kept the Virtus one. They, they only give me like a few months before. He just wanted, he was like, I just want a helmet. Give me a helmet and a, and a resi and you can go. And I just walked out of camp thinking that is bizarre. Yeah. And that, that was it. They, they didn't Crazy. want anything else or, or contact or anything from me. And it took me a while to get over. I how... can imagine. You, I can, I can imagine what that must feel like. You know yeah, I mean? like I said, so, I want to expect. It's it's closure, the right word. You want to like, what you want to do is you want to score a little out of it. it. Yeah, did that, did that, mega, tick it off, hmm. done, Sat, super satisfied, and leave. Yeah. And you don't get that with two yeah. stamps on a fucking sheet. Yeah. So I went in, and that period, I got, you get a resettlement, a terminal leave, you're getting paid still, and I wasted it. Again, because I was just, I got drunk for most of it. Well, I own the bar now, don't I? <laughs> so, yeah, I'm, yeah I'm, I'm going down to sort the bar out. Um, the manager quit then in November. I did then have to go in as the manager, knowing nothing. I knew nothing. And it, like, I remember the, and it was, that was good, great in a way for what was to come in the future, because I didn't go in there with old habits from, <coughs> oh, Karen in the commercial ill in said, this is the way to do it. And therefore, there was no, none of that. I went in and knew nothing. So it was blank canvas and I wanted to learn it from the bottom up which paid dividends later on I remember there was an Aussie girl who we inherited working there I said hi Gabby I'm Lee new owner and everything yeah how's it going I was like right glass wash machine show me the glass wash machine and she was like well what do you want to know I went everything she went yeah like what I went everything you know about that machine tell me <laughs> we'll start with how to turn it on and she's just looking at me going, he's the owner and he doesn't even know how to turn the glass machine on, the glass washer. And I was like, yeah, I don't, show me. So I learned everything from, from the bottom up, which was good. But of course then, fast forward to March, COVID. Mm. And I still weren't in a good place really, because even though I had, I was in a perfect position really. I'd left the core. And there was no real transition I needed to do because I already had a ready-made business and a project. There was no, what shall I do? Well, 
you got a business. That's what you're going to do. And that was the plan. I was now the manager and the owner. And COVID hit. And it just put me right off the rails. And I'll never blame COVID or anything else. There were environmental factors that created this perfect storm that I then allowed myself to fall into. And I did fall into it. I ended up in hospital from drinking myself nearly to death. Oh, like, shit. Yeah. like, yeah, a nurse found me in a ditch on her way to hospital. I'd been put into hospital. I'd escaped because it was just torturous to me to go and get a drink. Got a drink. You'd been in a hospital for what? Drinking. Right, okay. Yeah, just... You just put yourself been, in there, did you? Yeah, just because I, I lived on my own. Daughter lives in America. You ain't getting to see her anytime soon. Two years, as it turned out. And all these factors, like I said, it, they contributed. It, it was me. I always take ownership of I allowed myself to fall into it. But there was a lot of things helping me fall into it. The fact that my plan was, yeah, a bit of time to adjust from what's happened of me leaving the core. But I got a business. I got a project, which I always needed in, in life. And that, that was taken away. So then I'm left with... My daughter lives in the States. I can't see her. The, my business has just been closed. I live on my own. Didn't even have a dog at the time. It was just me in the house. You're not allowed to go anywhere because it's locked down. And for the first time in 20 years, I've got absolutely no accountability, responsibility, focus, nothing. If I want to sit here and drink whiskey in my pants fall asleep, wake up and do it again, I can. There's not, nobody's going to be on the phone going, why haven't you come checked in with work? Why haven't you done this? Why haven't you done that? And another thing that didn't help it was the fact that I had money in the bank. It might have helped if I did actually need to go and get a job in the meantime. Because I had my pension in. I'd always been, one thing I'd been sensible with throughout my life was money. And not getting married probably helped. I'm not allowed to say that. But I had no debt at this point, low mortgage, no debt, no, not even any finance. My car, I bought a camper van, I bought that outright, no credit cards or anything. I had my pension in, in the bank now. I'd spent my, my savings on buying the bar, but then the pension went in to replace that, which was nice. And there's money going in every month as well as part of the pension. So you're like, well, if I don't do anything during COVID, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna make any money, but I'm also not gonna lose my house or not be able to pay my bills or anything. <laughs> If I'd had to go, right, well, I need to go and get a job now to get some money coming in. It could have helped me stop going into that hole. But the fact was, it was, I was, I was able to just sit there and not go and have a job or anything and, and let it consume me. And I did. And I went into it, went into hospital, came out and on form. I like in between the COVID lockdowns, I went to Mallorca on my own, cycling, um, no drinking. And that was the, the thing that a lot of the, the experts and things couldn't work out was they're like, how can you just absolutely smash yourself with a binge drink, end up in hospital and just come out and go, oh, well, I'm fine. I don't need to. You can just switch it off and not have an urge to drink or you go like two or three months training, getting focused and not, and not even thinking about drink. You don't need any like added help, like counseling to wean yourself off it. But then after three months, you just fall off a cliff again. Why do you think you were able to do it then? Good job, because it wasn't a um, like an alcoholic urge. Now a lot, a lot of friends, and I, I was guilty of it because would say you're an alcoholic, and I was like, well, yeah, I must be, because we traditionally associate with drinking and coping and being in that mess as well. You're an alcoholic because you're dependent on alcohol. And once I got into it after a couple of days of binging, yeah, I was then dependent on it because the body's like, I need it now because you've you've put yourself in that position but it was never an urge to drink that put me into it initially it was a conscious choice or oh i i fancy a drink tonight or oh i'm gonna have one it wasn't like i need to drink tonight i need to drink so that was an important part because then when i came out of it there wasn't that still a voice going all the time you need to drink and i'm fighting this voice it was just i decide to do it and then unfortunately there'd be no backstop like we do it in the core but you got to go back to camp on sunday so there's there's you, you got to rein it in but there was nothing here to rein it in. And the, one of the guys, when I came out of one of the hospital spins, he, he summed it up and he said, I've been in this game 20 odd years. And he said, I've seen every addiction you can think of. He said, all your friends will now be saying you're an alcoholic. And he said, you're not in the traditional <coughs> sense. 
And this was about a week after I'd got out of one of my hospital stints. And he said, I'll tell you why. He said, if you were an alcoholic, you're a week out of one of these stints, right? He said, it's three in the afternoon. You, you wouldn't have, you'd either would have turned up drunk because it's three in the afternoon and you would have had to have a drink today if you're an alcoholic by three o'clock. You wouldn't have turned up because you're drunk or passed out somewhere. Or you would have turned up like you are, but you'd be physically shaken because you haven't had a drink and it's three in the afternoon. He said, for those reasons, you're not an alcoholic in a traditional sense. You're a binge drinker who can go completely without it. And then something might trigger you or you might just foolishly go, oh, I can have a few tonight. I can control it, which it was a lot of the time, but I couldn't. Because once it started, there was no backstop. And he's like, for those reasons, you aren't. So you, you, there's something different. And a lot of people were saying, you need to go to rehab. They were focused on, you need to go to a four week in-house rehab. And that was their only solution to it. And this expert was like, he said, if I sent you to a rehab now, referred you, he said, they'd send you back. They'd ring me and go, and Steve, what are you doing? Why are you sending this guy to us? He's got no alcohol in his system. He's got no craving or desire for it. We can't medically detox him or, and there's nothing we can do to wire his brain to stop him wanting to drink because he doesn't want one. He's, he's, so he said, there's no point me sending you uh, to rehab. There's other ways to rehab because that, that isn't the, the fix all. Like Amy Winehouse went there lots of times, didn't she? Didn't work for her. Didn't work for a lot of celebrities. Um, there's other ways to rehab, isn't it? Mine was getting back to being the person I was before I fell into that. And that's having a focus, getting my teeth into something and having a little bit of, I, I do need accountability. I need, I couldn't be someone that if I won the lottery, I could just go and lay on a beach or just cut about doing nothing. Because I'd, I'd get bored and I'd have to self-destruct to get myself out of the boredom or something. Yeah, I, yeah, I know what you mean. I think a lot of people think that, but I think there is a part of that which is, um, I think there's a part of that which is that you just don't place enough value on doing nothing. Mm -hmm. Like that. Oh, yeah. And, and I'm the same, many people are the same. And, um, Beat myself up if, yeah, if I'm not doing something. over the last sort of year or so, I try and make myself do nothing. Oh, my God, it's hard. Mm. It's so hard. When I say do nothing, I mean do something like a reading book or literally just sit there and chill, watch TV, and not be doing a million other things at the same time. It's so hard to do. And I, but I think that is a product of your background in that, especially military background, especially the kind of units you serve with, and that is that, you know, you, if you spend a lot of time on operations and on missions, uh, every every second or you're on one of those things, every second that you have, whatever you're doing needs to be for the reason for the success of the mission. Whether that's sleeping, you know, if you've got nothing to do, yeah. you've done your admin, you've done your planning, you've yeah. done your fucking reporting, yeah. you've done your, your you sleep, you X Y Z, you sleep. Yeah. It's like you know, you do sleep, and that is you do that, and then when you wake up. You wake up at, the, at a specific time because there is stuff you need to do and your waking hours are filled with uh, you know, a list Structure. of events. Bang, 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 bang. Do this, then do this, then do this, then do this, then do this. I think we're so used to that and a lot of people can't switch off from it, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my I best mean, friend predicted it. The one who was saying like, oh, you're an iconic, whatever. Years before, he said, you've lived like with the death of my father. I was meant to go to Afghan the next day. So I got, we found him. And so rang work. I went in and Sam Agent, Sergeant, amazing at the time, they were like, right, you tell us what you want to happen because we're going to Afghan tomorrow. But you tell us. They weren't saying this is what you're going to do. You tell us. I said, well, I'd like to stay for the funeral and then I want to come out and join you, which I did. And Paul always said, so all these things, he said, you never stopped to take it all in. He said, you lived your life at a thousand miles an hour purposefully so even when you had time off you'd still you wouldn't sit around and do nothing you'd go and live on us or some sort of adventure traveling he said at some point that's going to stop and it's going to hit you hard and it did he was he was 100 percent right because mm. that thousand miles an hour stopped and i didn't know how to deal with it stopping mm. it was very unfortunate that covid landed on at exactly the same a month my tx date was february 19th of February 2020 a month later the Covid so it oh was 
just the unbelievably bad timing. Uh, and he called it, and he was yeah, he was devastated. It's right. like a kind of chaos, isn't it? It's like a kind of chaos where you've got w without without direction or or knowing exactly what you're supposed to be doing to achieve whatever the aim is. Mm. You're like, let you fucking chaos. Don't know, yeah. don't know what to do. I've you know I've experienced a similar 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 thing, and um, and uh, you end up. Different coping mechanisms, mine, similar to yours, is alcohol all the time. Mm. Um, but, you know, one of the things I found that we, you know, can I still, sometimes I still struggle with mm. that. Like, I, I think, uh, yeah, I get I a bit of anxiety around, if I don't know what's going on, and it, this, this isn't like a, con, this isn't like control freak madness, but if I not, sh if I don't, like, know, for example, what I've got on first thing tomorrow, mm. right, I don't feel great about that. Mm. It doesn't, Stop me doing anything, but I, I know now that I feel a bit better if I know what my first time in is for the next day, yeah. even if there's nothing on the next day. It's a Saturday, there's nothing on as long as I know what my first thing I need to do tomorrow is at what time do I think I'm going to get up. My god, that makes a difference. Yeah. And I went through when I was really uh, struggling mentally, I went through um, a few times when I could had the capacity to be able to drive myself to do this was write down the list of things I need to do the next day and I would work backwards. It was like a, you know, you work backwards from the H hour and, um, and I would write down all the things I need to do, how long it would take, as if I was planning a fucking mission. Mm. How long I needed them to take. And I go, right, when do I need to start that? When do I need to start? Bang, 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 bang. You work all the way back and go, okay, I need to get up at this time to be able to do those things. Or I should do to be able to do these things and then build this in. And he felt incredible. Because it was like, I was, I was artificially giving myself the, the mission brief for the next day, mm. and in my head, I was like, "I know what I'm doing. Yeah. I got, it. I got it clear." Yeah. Now that's great in that situation, mm. but in COVID, when you can't go out, yeah. you know, and you can't go out the door, I did not experience what you yeah. experienced. There was a COVID. thousand things I, I could have been doing: learning a language, yeah, playing exactly. piano. Yeah. yeah. But I didn't have to do them. <laughs> that was the thing. Oh, yeah, exactly. That was the main difference. Well, what's the point? Yeah. Like, there was loads of things I could have been doing, but I didn't have to. So I was like, and I'm exactly the same to what you just said. That now. If, if, if it, tomorrow, if it was a normal day at the bar where I just got to go in and open up, but there's not, nothing set in stone that I have to do, I'll wake up in the morning and it'll take me a while to get going. Because I'm like, oh, what, what should I be doing first? What, what have I got to do? If there's like, I've got to go in mega early to do a line clean, which isn't a very nice task, but if I, I move from out of bed and I'm gone. Because I'm like, yeah, yeah, I've got to go and do line clean. I know I've got purpose. I know exactly what I've got to do. There's no grey area of me going, oh, shall I do that first? Or is that more important? There's no indecisiveness. It sounds mental for somebody who's in the military for so long that you can allow that to go in there. But it does. If I've got to go and get stock early in the morning. Far, I, oh, I'm very focused in the morning and I'm all over it. But those mornings where this is exactly the same as you, where there's any doubt about what I've got to do first or what is the most important things I need to take off, I'm like deflated from the off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So like the night before, I'm like, right, what, what is it? Oh, the coffee machine's broken. All right, I got to get a new part for the coffee machine. And that's a vital task. Brilliant. I've got something I definitely 100% need it's to do. It sounds so ridiculous, isn't it? But it's also, it's also if you can, if you can manage that. Yeah, you gotta, if you can identify it. Yeah. Super, for all the reasons, having that attitude when you're serving is super useful. Yeah. When you know what needs to be done, how long it's going to take, what time you need to do things, the earliest time, the latest time you need to start them. My God, if something goes pear shaped, you're ready for it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're, ready, you're, ready, you're ready to rock, you know what yeah. I mean? Um, and I think that's yeah. affected, well, it has. And I've been thinking about this quite a lot recently as well my time off. Because with the bar, I mean, you don't really, you're working work more on weekends because obviously it's a bar, there's more people out drinking. But when I was in, whenever you got any time off, even if it was just an afternoon, it just felt great. Even if you didn't really do anything, that moment that, oh, I'm just free for a while. I don't have to think about work. I can just go and, I mean, do whatever I want to do and, and enjoy it. I struggle with that now because I'm like, should I be doing something for the bar? My any tight days off I get, they don't really feel like good days off. Um, so yeah, it's, it's. Why do you think that is? Again, maybe the, the the guilt thing of the routine. It's like, should I be doing something now? Uh, am I just feeling guilty that? Well, I've got a business. Surely, 
everyone tells you when you go to business, you should be doing everything every minute of the day to drive it forward. And if you're not, you're not a good business owner. So it is a bit of me going, I'm feeling guilty because I'm not, if I'm having time off, or is it just that thing of in the military, there was focus when I'm in work, this is exactly what I got to do. As soon as they say, right, you got two days off. Well, I don't have to do anything to do with work. That's just two days off now that I can just forget about it and go and enjoy it. As with the business, no, I can't forget about it. So I'm still sort of, you still got you on an elastic band of emotion yeah, pulling you back into it. You have to brief somehow. yourself up with that. So my, that's that's yeah, the key that's managing yourself. yourself. Up, like you've literally got to pep talk yourself and go, right, why am I, why can't I relax? That's yeah. what it is. It's yeah. kind of like, why can't I relax? What's my first? Yeah. What What's wrong with me? Back? Do I need What's to No. <laughs> I'll chill the fuck out then. Yeah. And I, I do think COVID has, it's got a lot to answer for on it has hurt that as well because in between the gaps of they, they mess us around so much and they right you're locked down you can't do anything oh now you can open for outdoor areas now you can open fully two weeks later we, we got a fire break lockdown oh we're great i brought all this stock and now you're going to close me for two weeks or whatever it was yeah. and of course staff you're like i'm taking on staff and then they're like we have a lockdown and they're like oh, i'm not coming back i'm doing something i've gone back home they're uni students or They've gone off into something else. So throughout all those things, I was working morning till night on my own in that bar, serving and obviously trying to do all the admin stuff for the bar. And I think that has hurt me with my relationship with the, with the bar a lot because it was I just got you see it more of a chore. Then. Mission, yeah, mission fatigue. Oh, it's okay. just every day, every day of my life just revolved when going in, treading water to keep that place open and alive until I could get it to the place I got it now, which is a great position. And I think it's like anything in it, you do so, so much, something so repetitively for so long, it drains you a little bit and it takes that shine off it. Mm. Whereas what should be a great thing, I got my business, I can do what I want and go to the gym when I want, I can manage my own time. It took a little bit of the shine off because it just hammered me all throughout that COVID, mm. ups and downs, we got to open, there's no staff, right? I've got to work seven days a week, morning till night. Mm. Um, yeah, Wales. And then maybe now when I do get time off, I'm like, well, I never had that for the first three years of it. They, they didn't exist. So now I'm, I'm like, should I be having time off? Because, yeah. Mm. Well, Wales had it. They, they had, well, you, yeah, this COVID was treated a lot more harshly. It wasn't yeah. Even, it was and what was crazy. ridiculous was that Drakeford, who was the first minister at the time, was acting like a petulant child to London. So obviously Conservative government, Welsh Labour, and you could tell, it was like, England were going, right, we're going into a lockdown for these four weeks, whatever the periods were. And he'd come out, he'd, he'd, do, the, he'd do his press conference earlier. So Boris was coming out to say at 1 p.m. to say that we're going to go into lockdown for these four weeks, which well, Welsh never knew. They'd come out like an hour earlier and have their press conference, or we're having hours on a different four weeks. And he had like, there was pubs on either side of the border where one was allowed to be open and the other one wasn't. And that just messed everything up. He said, just get it all from Westminster. We all do the same thing. We're all on the same, same island. And it, it seemed like he was just doing it. There was no logic. It was just doing it because he wanted to be different to London. Mm. And yeah, the hospitality, we got hammered. I mean, he's teetotal. So has he got it in for? Oh, is he? Drink, yeah, oh, drinkers. Right. So that was a lot of things going around. Well, he doesn't drink himself. And hospitality got we the rules were just fine. I remember more the only reason I handle what was going on in Wales with it is because um, you know Assi uh, Ospreys Wales Assi mm. rugby player, so he has the bar in East Ten Twenty One. Yeah, and I remember I used, he was poked. You know, sort of, you know, he was poked and stuff about it. I remember, I'm sure I remember at one point, and they said, "Oh, you could, you could bars could open up, eat or drink outside if they had, if they had, if they had facilities outside." For dining, and I remember I think Assi went and invested in a load of uh, outside tables and chairs and umbrellas and that. And then the next lockdown, Drake would change the rules. Change it, yeah. So t didn't you know, know where we stood. Thousands and thousands of pounds, in, and then he would change the rules to, yeah. to reverse it back, just yeah. like destiny. It was, but the yeah. incompetence, I mean, the incompetence was across the board, COVID, mm. England, Wales, yeah. wherever you look, it was across the fucking board, mate. Mm. It was wild. Didn't, uh, didn't Wales have the um, have aisles taped off and stuff as well? One well, the supermarkets, yeah. right. they had like the one way system or whatever. Yeah, ridiculous. I think it was aisles taped off. It was non essential, yeah. it was essential. Yeah, non essential. Yeah, people were getting fined for it and everything. <laughs> I think Asda were like, oh, they, well, they didn't get fined. They got like, I got shut down for two weeks 
the first night I reopened after co- after the first COVID Why lockdown is that? for breaking the rules. What was the rule we broke? They, the first night I opened, they turned up. I'd just gone up. They caught me by surprise how many people came out. So they all came in the bar and it was all, you could only sit in groups of four, I think. You weren't allowed to stand up. You weren't allowed to dance. It was like the film Footloose. Remember Footloose where they're not allowed to sing and dance and all these things are prohibited. It was like that. So everyone had to sit in groups of four. They couldn't speak over a certain level in decibels. They were like, oh, what? Yeah, oh, yeah. I didn't know that. Oh, 100%. One. You were fucking joking. Yeah, so the music couldn't be over a certain um, volume in decibels because that would encourage people to sing and then they're projecting spit oh and God, everything into, into the that. air. People weren't allowed, you weren't allowed to shout or talk loudly, 100%. You weren't allowed to dance, you weren't allowed to talk loudly, you weren't allowed to, you had to be two meters apart and everything sat as well. You had to be sat down, table service only, they couldn't come to the bar. And I opened this first night and carnage. You ever tried to tell drunk people that they can't talk loudly and they got to sit down and they can't come towards the bar in Wales? Impossible. Um, and I'd, we got a downstairs area as well. I go downstairs, they were all, they were all like up dancing and everything. I like, look guys, and they're trying to give me stick. It's like, I don't want to be telling you that you've got to do all this stuff, but you have. I'm just, don't shoot the messenger. And then they'd be like, oh, yeah, we do understand, yeah. They'd all sit back down. i turn my back to go walking out. They'd all be on tables dancing again. You're like, you couldn't police it at all. Licensing turned up that first night I opened. Um, yeah, we're not happy with this. People are too close. People are, are dancing. People are, are singing and shouting. And I was like, yeah, fair enough. I stayed up all night writing like a statement of improvement. I was like, it's the first night. We've been caught out with the volume of people and how we police it because we've never done it before. Statement of improvement, pages and pages of it. They said we'll be back tomorrow. And they came back the next day with council licensing because the police licensing couldn't close me that night. The council licensing have to do it. So he came back with them the next day. I handed them this thing. Didn't even look at it. They already had the closure notice in their hands. I thought it was going to be, yeah, all right, fair one. Stay closed for a few days to work on what you said. You can reopen. It was just, boom, Jesus closed for two Christ. weeks. And before I got home, it was in Wales Online. Copper Bar Swans, he'd been closed for break, breaking COVID rules. Oh my it was God. in the paper before I got home. It's, it was, honestly, it was savage. Oh, but none, none of the big chains had any of that because they'll fight it, obviously. But what? small independents, they're like, yeah, we, we can make an example of him. Because that's what they wanted to do. They wanted to say to everyone, don't step out of line because we'll close you down. Well, we accepted it, mate. Yeah. Accepted oh, it. Yeah. And you think back, wild. Mm. No, I accepted it. You accepted it. Everything mm. like that. You know, you can't go yeah. fucking... But it backfired on them with me because then I went and actually read the legislation on it. And unfortunately, there was a lot of... Well, we know there was false information. But the council of licensing were projecting things that the people then thought were black and white in law that weren't. So... For, ex- for example, and I sat down and read through it all so I knew exactly what, what was law and what wasn't. They turned up after I'd reopened and they were like, oh, are you taking, it'd, be, it'd been in the news, oh, bars can reopen, but they've got to take um, bookings only by email or phone and that way. <clears throat> so they turned up, they're like, oh, are you taking bookings only? I was like, no. They're like, oh, right, but we, we're advising you to take bookings only. I went, yeah, I know. Thanks for your advice. But it's not law that I, that I must take bookings only. They were like, yeah, yeah, it isn't. It was the wording. In all that stuff that came out, some of it would say, you must wear masks. you got to wear masks. That's law. A lot of it was, we recommend, we advise, you should. And people didn't make that distinction. So a lot of the bars and other businesses, I was going to run around telling them all, you don't need to do that. That's a, that's a recommendation. As long as you're not being stupid about it, and you have a reason of why you're not taking that recommendation, you get away with it. And they were like, all right, yeah. And they were like, oh, have you packed all the pool table and everything away? No. Oh, but we advise you to have, like, social games and everything packed away. I went, thanks for your advice again, but it isn't law. And they were like, we've got right one on our hands here. So that backfired on them because I then actually read it word for word and worked out that a lot of it was they were trying to project that it was law, but it wasn't. They were just telling people, oh, yeah, you have to do it. But it, in, when you read it, it didn't actually say you did. The thing is, everyone was stuck between a rock and a hard place. And as well, you know, from the... Because, yeah, the, you don't the like upset them. folk had turned up. They were just, every, it was just brand new to everyone, wasn't it? Yeah. Brand new to everyone. Um, 
what a wild uh, oh yeah it's just one off wild one. situation that was but I, I think if it, if it happened again we'd end up going doing it all again I think if we, we just we would just be holding to the behold mm. the beast man God, I yeah. think I think we would I, I'm not not convinced we wouldn't yeah a lot of people would push back you know they would now but I think so but I think the, I think the laws would be harsher if you look what's being done now yeah done, yeah but, yeah oh, yeah oh, can't oh, say it so you've been oh, jailed but Jesus Christ <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to say anything dodgy about stuff like that won't be here much longer but um yeah wild mate wild so what led you to writing the book then? I'd always wanted to write a book since talking about reading books earlier. I read books when I was younger, not just military books. When we were in school, I didn't really excel at school just by choice. I could have. I just wanted to be out running around or whatever. But whenever we sat down to read, I loved it. I loved reading the books. And then I started to read more military ones. And I loved the ones like I've written, where it was this young lad from a council estate or low educated background who gone on to have this like massively adventurous life he joined the forces and he'd gone to war and he'd done all these trips and everything and i'd always loved those type type of books and then obviously started serving and the luck of the draw i started ended up in these exciting posts and it, it, the story started building up and i was like i, I will write a book about this one day and a lot of people say to me, oh, how long did it take to write? Thinking that I sat down one day and said, I'm going to write th this book now and then wrote it from the start to the, to the finish. And it didn't because I wrote it in, because I liked writing anyway. So I started writing the chapters of it years ago. So when they say, oh, how long did it take? Well, 10 years. It, it, if you want to go from when I wrote the first thing to do with it till releasing it, I'd write down back in 2014 on my last Afghan tour, I started writing some chapters, which are towards the end of the book, because I just wanted to write down about that, what had happened, that story. With one eye on, oh, this probably will end up as a book one day. But when that was a really interesting thing that happened, and I want to write a story about it. So it was sort of chapters and short stories in no particular order. And then it got to a point then later on, maybe around during COVID, I thought, actually, it's now got the basis of a book. Let's now put it into some sort of order and fill in the gaps with some other stories that I haven't already written about and then make it into the book. So, yeah, that's how that came about in a sort of roundabout way of writing about it before it was going to be a book. So, so when did you finish it? Finished it 20, well, yeah, just over a year ago. So 2023, May, re released it May 2023. What do you want to achieve with it? Why did you do it? So why did you do it? And what, what, yeah, I what just, are you trying to do? Yeah, I just, like I said, I liked writing about these stories. It was just I, out of the love of yeah, writing about this stuff. I mean, and... even in my young days in the, in the Marines, we have our Globe and Laurel magazine, our like quarterly magazine that they put out. One of the officers got me to write an article about our trip to Norway and that. I loved writing, writing that. Um, so I was writing, like, liked writing little articles and, and sto short stories. So one is enjoyment. I just love doing it. And it, yeah, it just felt like I said from a young age, loving those type of books. I was like, well, I've got it's not it's not going to be forced now. I've got enough stories of this life I've had to stick it into a book. So yeah, mm. we were talking. Was it on the icebreaker or was it on the start of this of the actual podcast? Here we were talking about the brain, the muscle, read it, the reading muscle. Mm. You know, exercising that muscle. It's the same with writing. Mm. I really enjoy I really yeah. enjoy writing. I hardly ever do it because I can't mm. commit myself to do it. Yeah. Like time and effort and whatever other reason I want to invent for myself. But when I have done it in the past, talking about things, my God, you end up processing information, especially when you talk about historical stuff that you've been mm. through. You end up processing things in a way that you I don't think you would have otherwise done if you mm. had just been thinking about the memory that you had have had about some something. You have a better understanding of it, I think. Mm. It's such a great, such a great communication tool for um, for to getting your ideas across. For that, for that reason, you know, yeah. a story read on paper is totally different to a story conveyed in words. Oh, yeah, you know what I mean? definitely, totally. Yeah, different. and I and I find it quite easy. A lot of people who've maybe had an interesting life and they've gone, "All right, I need to write a book about it because it is interesting." They'll probably really have to force themselves to sit down and write it. 
But once I get down and start doing it, it, it helps because it's biographical. So the stories, it's not like a fiction book where you're trying to invent characters and plot lines to tie in. And like they're already there because they happened. I just need to turn them into um, something that's that's quite entertaining. You know I mean, and and uh, interesting. In, put them in an interesting format. So I always found it. I could just sit down and just start writing thousands and thousands of words would just fly out in one night. So it was enjoyable and in, more enjoyable because I didn't find it difficult. Mm. A lot of people would be like, oh, and they'd really have to force himself. But I was like, no, this is there any parts in it you found, you found more difficult to write? Chapter about my father. So mm. that one, I, I've, that was the last chapter I finished on it because I avoided it. I sorted, I wrote the basis of it when I was going through it in logical order. So I wrote some of the stuff down in there in a loose order. I went on to write the rest of the book or, and put the ones I had written and then obviously tidy them up and delayed, that delayed releasing it because I just didn't want to go back and write that chapter. I was just avoiding it, making excuses. Was well, that because you didn't want to? You didn't want to think of him in his uh, yeah, just because of that yeah, the whole thing about it is I didn't want to stir up that emotion a bit, and also fear. I was like, how can I do this justice now? I I don't know how to write this. Like all the other stuff is pretty straightforward, really, because the stories are there. Just make them make sense and be quite interesting. But it's like this: well, how do I how do I write about this? Because it's not something you sit there and like. Like the, the Iraq story, I can, I can sit back and look at that fondly now. It's quite funny parts to it as well and reminisce with Mark about it. But you don't sit down and reminisce about that, ever. So it was definitely something that delayed the process. And in the end, I went, just, you got to do it now. you got to just sit down and, and take was the he, uh, Was he ex mil No. Nobody, my grandfather was the only military presence in quite a big family. He had loads of brothers and my brother had, um, my father had five sisters. So lots of cousins and stuff. And through all of that extended family, my grandfather was the only one and pretty special one. He was Lancaster bombers in the second world war. So yeah, it's like, really? Yeah. Like the survival rate. Yeah. What was of, your grandfather's of, um, name? Ronald West. What, William Ron, William Ronald West. I yeah. knew a um, I knew a Lancaster navigator who lived in you know Cryant. Yeah. Who lived in Cryant. I grew up. Mm. He was a, he was a navigator in Lancaster. Yeah. Bombers. Do you know what plane your granddad was on? No, we've got we've got like a big scroll picture of his squadron yeah. uh, on it, so that's got all the details. But I don't I need to get his box. My auntie still got his box of everything, and I and he he's on the same plane because he you never know, navigate, right? Yeah, yeah. the plane was yeah. called Friday the Thirteenth, quite happy. Yeah, <laughs> and on the side of the on the side of, on the side of the plane in the front, mm. called Friday the Thirteenth, had a picture of death with a sickle on the front. Yeah, like, oh, yeah. pretty cool. You couldn't do yeah. that these days. Oh no, and, couldn't and do like, that these survival days. rate is one in three when it are those yeah. missions. Was, it? Just like, was yeah. it? Yeah, one in three. The Lancaster. One in three. Was, I didn't yeah, know that. Like unbelievable. Jesus. And didn't know that at all. He never spoke about it, which I'm gutted about. He he fell over and he died in the garden, fell over and hit his head on a step in the garden. And he like he survived all that and then and obviously gutted he eventually got these stories out of him. And it wasn't the you get that and he's like, Oh, he doesn't want to talk about it and it wasn't because of like, oh he you just um, I think he was guilty and he he turned to the Lord after after the war. Was devout Christian. We all had to go Sunday school when we were younger, like full on, like old school t Christian. You mean like you couldn't do anything on a Sunday, couldn't drink. He was. Yeah. Oh Jesus. Like full on converted. It was strict. Like he, he weren't like a strict. I mean, he was strict, but not like a boring person or anything. But it was he stuck to the to those like a ways. normal Christian. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess. <laughs> you know what I mean he, he couldn't drink at all, couldn't can play sport on a Sunday. So they were devout. And I think a lot of that was, I think, guilt because they carpet bombed Germany and the amount of people that died in those from our bombing raids, there would have been. And I think that was one of the reasons he wouldn't talk about it. Then he turned to the Lord and maybe it wasn't, it was a bit unbecoming of a Christian to start talking about those type of things, but also for his own, his own things, he probably he didn't want to think back about all that destruction. Um, mm. Which we get to about because you don't get the stories from him from it. Yeah, that's a different thing, isn't it? Uh, to go through that experience, I think it's something that people really overlook. You know, yeah. you, you can have this opinion, you can have this perception that um, 
as well, to the RAF, for example, or any Air Force, yeah. are detached from it, don't don't yeah. see the realities of war and yeah. all this. But then, on the flip side, yeah. well, that's certainly not true for the Second World War, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. But then, well, it could be for some Lancaster bombers, maybe, or whatever, who, did, who never ever got shot up, which is probably none of them. But um, but on the flip side, there is like the things they would get asked to do are, are far and far and far yeah. beyond the things that like we would get asked to do on the ground. Yeah. yeah. You know, going, they'd have been responsible for far yeah. more deaths than somebody in. On D Day, Go running on. up the beach shooting yeah. a rifle. Yeah, yeah. Go and in, going indiscriminately, lob uh, rockets and grenades and mortars into this, civilians. this town over here. And that's the difference. That. You'd be like, what? Why are we doing it? Yeah. I mean, that probably did happen in the Second World War and, and probably has happened since another war. So mm. that does happen since another war. Mm. But certainly not the level of carpet bombing a fucking city. Yeah. I said that the soldiers, maybe on, on D Day and stuff, well, they're shooting other soldiers. Mm. They're still a human being, but. Yeah. They, they compensate the fact that he killed a human being was the fact that he was trying to shoot me. He's, but on those planes, they were bombing civilians, who just whole cities, Dresden, and you know I mean, raising them to the ground, just m- murdering. Obviously, it was war. And yeah. then to come back and have to, um, you know, and they, yeah, they'd have got demobbed because they obviously been called up just for the war. It's not like oh, I've joined like us. I've joined. Well, I'm probably going to go somewhere tasty and see a little bit of that. They've been called up. They've gone and done it, and then they've gone right. It's over now. Off you go. Go D-mob. be a carpenter again. D mob, but then I've have it glorified. Mm. If you feel wrestling with something like what you did like that, and you go fucking hell, man, all that, you don't know who you were killing. Mm. You know, literally don't. And then to have the actions glorified, where mm. when you're a hero, yeah, you're amazing, yeah, and yeah. then knowing, knowing that. Those people saying that have the naivety of not mm. ever experienced those kind of things, not knowing what actually went on, not knowing just how much carnage war is and just how much unnecessary death and destruction mm. there is. But then to be glorified as a hero, yeah. it must be incredibly difficult. Yeah. I'm glad that I haven't had to experience yeah. that in that, yeah. in that way. You know, it's like Cause that's, uh, that's I mean, turmoil. That's in the turmoil, isn't it? It's like everyone's saying I'm amazing, but I've done the most disgusting things that a human could be asked to do. Mm-hmm. That sits in a turmoil for forever. Yeah, yeah, different, different, uh, different breed back then. Different breed, you know. It's like it. Yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't like. It wasn't just a gener. It wasn't. It was generational, wasn't it? But it was mm. not. You know, like we did Afghan and Iraq. We literally had what twenty years, about fifteen years of non-stop military action, British forces anyway. But it only really impacted. The British forces mm. didn't impact civvies no. unless it was a civvy who lost someone close to them, lost Connected. a loved one. Yeah. You know what I mean? Unless it was something like that, or so, or a loved one that was really badly injured or hurt, you know, or or, me- or became really mentally ill because of it. But um, no one else was impacted by it, mm. you know. So mm. you've got this sort of sub sub not culture. You've got this like strata slice of of society which is kind of be impacted in a big way by it. Mm. You yourself as an example, mm. and everyone else is going about it willy nilly. Yeah. We're back in the Back in the day, everyone knew about it. Everyone was impacted by it, even a c- civilian. They just done what 30, 1939, 1945, and the years preceding, and the years after of like rationing, mm. couldn't even get yeah and a food, <laughs> you know, mm. all of that stuff that you take for granted. Yeah, uh, I call us the ge- the golden generation though for those years with Iraq and Afghan because joined and feet didn't touch the f- the ground. If that's what you wanted, which it is what I wanted yeah. when I went in there, it was. And then when I, I saw the flip side, when I was sergeant taking the junior command course through, so guys coming through to be corporals, and then we we put the blues on to have the, the end of course photo, and there'd be guys there with no medals. Now, I'm not one of those who oh, you ain't got any medals, because there's guys out there with racks of medals who did nothing. You know what I mean? Apart from sit in a sandbag or flip eggs. So I'm not saying that, and it isn't anyone's fault, because it is the luck of the draw. When you join, if there's nothing going on, well, that's not because you're a pussy and you don't want to go to war it just wasn't going on so i'm not saying it's anyone's fault but it was just a stark reminder that how well i did get the golden generation you get these guys now who get who get promoted to corporal who haven't gone and done any that we've done like i said not for any fault of their own but that's shifted now from us it was guaranteed that you were going to go and do it whereas then we, we move on to a generation now who Oh, it's a tough. lot of them won't. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to be joining now. It's tough, you know. Um, uh, you have a, you have situ, the, the, you have these like peaks and troughs of operational tempo yeah. in 
in British military, I can't speak for the US or anything else, but it's probably the same, of operational tempo. And in those troughs where there's not a lot going on, my God, the military's a crap place to be. And I know that because I caught the tail end of a trough. You know, mm. I joined in 2000. Nothing much had gone on before that. Mm. You had the Falcons War in 82. You had the Gulf War in, uh, what, 91? 99. 99, 99, 99, 99, 99, 99, 91, whatever it was. 91, yeah. Yeah. And you had some small little operations yeah, going on. and stuff Balkans, like that. Balkans, Kosovo. And don't get me wrong, yeah. people had experiences in those tours where mm. they weren't that small. You also had Northern Ireland going on. But towards the end of the 90s, Northern Ireland was buck she for most yeah, people yeah. like there was some dodgy shit going on but for buck she for most people and the military became a real shit place to be mm. you know and you had there was you know there were people in a lot of uh, influential ranks influential positions who had zero experience of actual mm. combat mm. zero experience right and then you fast forward to the golden age the sweet spot you know of, of, uh, of that of what we've just been through oh my god mate. Mm. The, the best time, the best and the worst time, I think, to be yeah. in the military because for the most part, even if you had a moron boss or a moron sergeant major, you knew at the very least they'd been and done things they had experienced. Yeah. So it was like they always had that about them. Yeah. Even if they were morons, there was always something yeah. there. Get, yeah. Now, nothing. Mm. And what's worse is when you, come up, when you come off the back, come enter into a trough like, like the military's doing now, operational tempos right down, you also have all of the experience leaves. All of the experience leaves. Mm -hmm. You know, all those guys have all experience gone. And mm -hmm. what you have is you have this like uh, yeah. this mess of There's people who populate the of... forces of a combination of people who join up because they want to experience the real stuff and they're never gonna. Mm -hmm. And they either become bitter or become disheartened by it and then maybe they leave or maybe they stay in and they just hate it for their mm -hmm. entire or you get others who just get in and they thrive on fucking people about they thrive on bullshit. Or you get others who don't know any better. So you're just in this culture where it's just constant training, constant bullshit taskings, and it's just nonsense. And you yeah. have zero experience until the next big thing kicks off, which goes on for years. Mm. It's a horrible place to be right yeah. now. I wouldn't want to be there. Yeah, and You're it affected, again, my decision to take that medical discharge was exactly that. I've lived through the golden generation. I've done it all. If I hadn't, I, and it was still something inside me wanting, I would have gone, no, I, I still want to stay in. Even though I may not have been kicking doors in, I still would have got a, a trips away and other things, something to hold on to. But it was because I'd got given everything I'd ever wanted. I was like, well, I can leave happy now because I didn't get that lull or that boredom. I was like, it was, under, it was a thousand miles an hour and it was great. I can, I can leave happy now. Mm. Yeah, it's crazy. I was on a, I did a, like a Q and A call for patrons with a, it was with uh, Michael Hawks. I got yeah. recently a, a X22 guy. Mm. And I can't remember who mentioned it on the call, but they were talking about the nineties. Who was it? Oh, I think it was a I think it was a lady called Tara McLaughlin, who was a patron. She's ex mill. And um she was talking about an exercise, I'm sure it was her, talking about an exercise they did in the nineties, some big well known exercise around like Cold War towards the end of the mm. Cold War. In I'm sure it was Germany. And on the exercise were 140,000 British troops on the exercise. <laughs> on the exercise. Wild. Mm. Wild. And what mm. have you got now? Like 80 or 90,000. Yeah, if that. Mental. The shortages. Mental. I don't know what, I don't know what, the world is changing in a big way. I don't know what way it's going, but it's, it's not, uh, it's not going to be pretty. I think, you know, we, we, it's all about that golden age you just lived through, mm. like in the military. I think the second half of our lives, mate, is going to be wild for all the wrong reasons. Yeah. All the wrong reasons. Yeah. Like, the world's going to turn on. I thought COVID was a, was a fucking weird one. The yeah. world's going to turn on. Something's going to go pear shit. Mm. Something's going to go pear shit. Something brewing, yeah. Yeah. Like, the USA, we've got a run right time. Yeah, but, well, I think we're off time. But the USA, like, literally, has got no strong leaders at the minute. Trump, mm. maybe again. Trump's a strong leader. I like him or I hate yeah. him. UK, what have we got? Mm. Starmer's on his way out. You know, Labour have got no one. Conservatives have got no one. If anything kicks off, we actually mm. need leadership. Yeah. We haven't got it. No. We literally Especially not it. on the foreign policy no. side of it. <laughs> no. I mean, you got a Lammy <laughs> going, going to the UN <laughs> and talking about, talking about his, his race. Talking about his blackness. Yeah. yeah. And then slagging off Israel and whatever you think of that situation, yeah. it's a key ally right. in a very hostile region. The other enemies that we got in the world want to get influence in as well. Do you mean Russia and China and you're like, we can't start losing allies in that part of the world. Well, the only ally in that part of the world. 
Well, I think, I mean, Russia, Putin's just waiting for us to implode. Putin's just waiting for America to implode mm -hmm. and all his problems are going to be gone. Because, mm -hmm. you know, Trump's on about changing the situation there, mm. you know, less, less activity. And China, mate, must be rubbing their hands going, oh yeah. my God, mm. the West is going to pot and they're doing it to themselves. Yeah. Like, and they're just rubbing their hands. They're just waiting. Yeah, we'll keep just doing what we're doing. Keep doing what we're doing. You just, mm. you know, you go and crumble. We'll just do the mop up after yeah. this and we'll be all right. Must be, must be mm. what they're thinking. Yeah, definitely. Do you know what was mad? Um, Putin going mm. off to King Jong and North Korea. Did you see that? <laughs> no, I've seen the memes of them stood in the doorbell with, with a bottle of vodka or something. <laughs> I said, no, I missed that. So what, what happened? Oh, good. Maybe a month ago now. He went off to. He went off to North Korea to try and get troops. From North. Basically, I think it was to broker a deal to have troops from North Korea go and fight. For Russia and Ukraine. Serious? Yeah, I was happy. <laughs> I thought he was just going to just talking to him about some trade deal or something. No, I was surprised. All right, surprised give me it. some troops to go yeah, and no, fight. Yeah, that's what it was. Yeah, yeah, that's what it was. I'm sure that's what it was. Wow. Yeah, I was quite surprised by it because I thought I, I would say Russia's in a pretty strong position at the minute. Mm. And it surprised me when uh, he went over there asking for that because it's like that is Korea up in the bottom of the barrel. Yeah, that's because yeah, you're going to get those degrees in yourself. They ain't going to want to do anything. <laughs> like they've got zero motivation. They've mm. probably got zero muscle. Mm. They've got zero like mm. brain. Capability. Yeah. Anyway, we're off on the right tangent. If they call, if they called you up now, would you go back? To go uh, to would you go off to Ukraine? My attitude has, has changed towards that because if when I'm in, they're like, "Are we going to Ukraine?" they would be like, "Yeah, get me on the next plane." As you get a bit older, you leave that thing, and you're sort, you're sort of like, mm, "Would I? Would I? I would." Because I think that is just in us, isn't it? If it came to the crunch. That's the thing, yeah. You're like, what type of person do you want to be? Do you want to get on that plane to Ukraine or not? Well, I can't live with the person that says, no, I'm not getting on that plane to Ukraine. So it looks like I'm going to Ukraine, whether I like it or not. So, yeah, because it, it is a shift in it. It's when you're just always on, you're always going to, there's always a chance that you're going to be going somewhere and doing something. And, you, and you're loving it as well. It's just like, pff, yeah, whatever. When you step back from it a little bit, you do get a little bit of time to still go, oh, actually, but yeah, is the answer. You would? Yeah. Would you? I'd be torn. I probably, I probably wouldn't. I probably wouldn't. If it was Ukraine, I probably wouldn't. Just... I mean, it, and it, it depends. If like, well, they just came in here and I went, do you want to, do you fancy it? And they're like, <laughs> no. I'd... But if it was, I got to the stage, you're like, well, we really need you because we're in the shit. Then yeah. we're like, well, yeah, all right then. Yeah, it's, it's the I thing wouldn't... is, it's two sides in it. It's mm. like, Okay, what am I going out there for? Am I going out, does it align with what I think? Now? Yeah. Like my core values and beliefs. Yeah, and what and are we going to get from it? What's the end goal? Be, get back in it. Get back in the thick of it. Go on, yeah. you fucking love it. And it is, you mm. read that again, you go, oh my God, yeah, mm. get, get fucking tooled up again. Back down there on the ground, have a team, cracking mm. on. Just well, like, yeah, it's funny you mention that because my friend back in Swansea, they, they'd send in like the aid, medical aid convoys out there. So I was going to jump in and let the venture in it. Jump, they drive all the way through Europe with like the med packs, the the pucker ones, and vehicles. They take the vehicles you drive out. You leave with them, and then you, they pay for you to get the train back all through Europe. So I was I was going to go out and do them. So I spoke to a couple of lads who know who are out there. As I mean, they've left now, so they're doing it on the private side, mercenaries, if you like. Um, they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll come and meet you at the at the border. We'll bring you forward. You can come and hang out with us or whatever, and it. And they're like, oh, do you want to get stuck in? I'm like, no, nah, lads, I'm just coming out to like drop this stuff off and maybe have a little look around, see what you do in, bit of interest, whatever, take some photos. And they're like, no balls, no balls. I was like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Innit? And they were like, Where yeah. Where is this? Hmm? Where is this? Ukraine. Oh, you went out there? No, I was going to go with one oh, of these so aid. Oh, so you going to go, right? So I was planning it. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and I still could because they're still doing it. And I was like, and they were like, I was like, no, I'm not coming out to scrap or anything, lads, no balls, blah, blah. And then they were like, yeah, but when you get here, you're saying that now, when you get here and we're going, we're going out on patrol, Westy, there's an LMG there. Do you know you're going to pick it up and come with us? And I'm like, yeah, it's probably going to happen, lads, if yeah. honestly. Yeah. So you're like, it is, isn't it? Yeah. I do, I do aid. I do aid. I've got a friend, uh, have you heard of Vans Out Borders? No. They're a... Uh... Fans of wanted to go out and deliver deliver aid in a in a right. van around. Well, it started off in Ukraine, but I got a friend who went out and did the first run before it became Vans Without Borders. His name John mm -hmm. John Bream, him and one other, literally white transit van. 
mm. drove to Ukraine. Yeah. And just started, basically filled the van up with like mm. supplies, random food, toilet yeah. roll, all this stuff that you assumed people wouldn't even out and just started delivering, just cutting about near the front line, and delivering this stuff out. And these stories are fucking unbelievable. Mm. Yeah, that's um, what they're doing, but it's med packs. They fill up the, the Rangers yeah, yeah. and Hiluxes with med packs, drive them out, leave the med packs and the vehicle there for them. Um, I think so, they'd be taking so helmets and But I'd want to, I'd, I'd want to push the envelope as far as I could. That's the thing. I'd want to go, right, well, okay, I'm delivering to people here now, Mm. but they're not that bad because there's no bombs and bullets going off. These aren't the people I really in the shit. I'd want to get closer and closer and Mm. closer to where I knew all the drama was. You know, you know, you're capable. It's yeah. like, okay, well, my capabilities have wasted you. Get yeah. me there. Yeah, just go and have a look. Yeah. And then give me a weapon when I'm there. Yeah. And maybe. Yeah, we'll see what happens. Maybe. That's, yeah, that's, it was, <laughs> yeah. I, 100%, yeah. yeah. And one of my, one of my lads died out there, uh, para. Oh, shit. Uh, he was troop sergeant. He was private in my, uh, platoon, as he was there. We call them platoons. Uh, Silent Guard. He got killed out there, um, it's about a year, year or so ago. I don't know. What, yeah. you, what, private? Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. yeah, went out as, they join, it's like the Ukrainian Legion, I think is, that is what they call it, I think. Okay. So it's like a foreign legion for Ukraine. So they're, they're part of the Ukrainian armed forces as foreigners. Uh, yeah. Yeah. How many blogs do you reckon are out there doing it? It must be a lot, because I know, I know a few. So for me to, to know... Yeah, but the circles you walk in, mm. you're going to know more than, than... Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, than the average, yeah. If you yeah. walk into one of the customers in Cartman, go, how many blogs do you know? <laughs> In Ukraine, if I none, <laughs> <laughs> how many would expect me to know? No, but I mean, even other units are less likely to go out and do this, you know. It's yeah, just, it's just, just not yeah. I, d- I don't know. What do you reckon? What do, what do you reckon the number ballpark? I, I got no idea, mate. I yeah. couldn't put a, I couldn't put a finger on it. I got no idea. I'd literally have to. I got no idea. Yeah. Brit, what British nationals? I don't know. British nationals fighting in the Ukrainian Foreign Legion. Let's think about this. I'm going to put a figure out there and say. British nationals. I don't think it'd be a lot, mate. Mm. I, I read a hundred. That's yeah. for the Ukrainian armed forces, though, mm. right? Now, how many are private contracting doing other stuff? Oh, shit, loads. A lot more. Yeah. A lot more. Yeah. Out there. There's not coin, the, there's good not coin involved. The Ukrainian armed forces, but only mm. doing armed forces stuff or doing mm. security stuff. Yeah. And that's a, that's a choice, isn't it? So we say, well, do you want to go and fight for the Ukrainian army or do you want to go as a private? Getting paid twenty times more. Yeah, I'll take the one twenty times more. Yeah, I've I, I've been invited out there a couple of times. I got invited out to Syria as well a couple of times, mm. doing stuff on contracts. You go read between the lines. You go. Oh, there'd be lords as well because. It's not. Yeah. I get what you're asking me to do here. I understand, mm. and it is not mm. what you're saying on paper. Yeah. It's you know it's pure, you mm. know. And, a, and there'll be loads as well, yeah, because that is great. similar to like a Baghdad situation. Because look how flooded that was with contractors and whatever. Because Ukraine now, whether anyone likes it or not, are in the USA's pocket forever. That's already like whatever Zelensky says is his goal or whatever. He ain't got a choice in it. Before he got all that aid and support, he'd have gone. You now are in our back pocket forever. Sign this that you are, or you ain't getting all the aid. And he's all gone, yeah. Right. So, with the private side of it, there'll be US companies and corporate and military <coughs> businesses, I mean, with ammunition and, I mean, uh, military hardware, or whatever. There'll be all sorts of US influenced private corporate contractors and stuff in that country now who obviously need private security contractors. Well, this is why the big, if you ask me, you're sceptical me, this is why the big drive is on to, um, which, this is why the situation is painted as an existential threat to the West. It's not because it's an existential threat to the West, because it's fucking not. If Russia, inv- if Russia invaded the rest of Ukraine today and took over Ukraine, guess what? Our lives would not be changed. They wouldn't. They fucking wouldn't. Like, our lives in the West would not be changed. It just wouldn't happen. But it gets painted as an existential threat, purely what you said there, mm. because money. There is so much money being made right now in that mm. war by mm. Western organizations, oh, and there's so much flooded. more money to be made once the war finishes and the rebuilding by yeah. Western organizations. Yeah. You know, Iraq model, yeah. um, 
Iraq model, Syria model, Afghan model, all these things are generated trillions yeah. for yeah, companies. Of as soon as that companies. vacuum's created by armed action, exactly. you then flood so it it's to... it's not an existential threat to the West, it's mm. an existential threat to the potential profits of these companies who are, mm. who are pervaded in the war. And that's the uncomfortable truth that I think most people don't want to open their eyes to. Especially, uh, especially ex-military people, or, or even serving military people, who are just completely blinded by uh, what's going on. You know, oh, we, we, the nuclear threat and all the rest of it. We're as much mm. of a threat of, of nuclear to him as he is to us. Mm. Yeah, it's a, it's a, yeah. it's neutral. That's it's the, not yeah, that's the whole point of the nuclear exactly. thing, isn't it? It's, it's a stalemate. Nonsense. And old Zelensky stuck in the middle. He's just a clown now. I just mm. laughing stock now. Unfortunately, I mean, I don't, I don't. I don't like the man much, but mm. he's also he is sort of a victim of his own success in becoming yeah. the, the and he, uh, he is um, now in the pocket and totally whether pocket. he likes it or not because totally yeah and he had no choice really because he was either be that or you don't get any help and you get rolled over by Russia. So, yeah. Again, <laughs> what's the drama? <laughs> People are just like he purged the history yeah. of that place. Mm. He purged it, you know. I mean, we won't get into that now. We've been doing well with Ukraine. Maybe not for this. Yeah. So, would you think about writing fiction books then? I did have a little think about maybe doing like a Jack Reacher type one. I actually wrote down some notes about what who, how the character would be and everything. But I would find it, it would be more time consuming because I would find it a lot harder, I think. But I, I've never tried it, so I don't know. I might. You can just make sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. That is the easy part of it. Yeah, you can just put whatever you want into it. Then the hard part is then making that shit you made up make sense as well and tie in and stuff like that. So they are much better when a military person. Mm. You can tell when a military person writes a book that yeah. has anything to do with weapons yeah. or fighting. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. There's a few military authors now I've interviewed, and there's another one coming on soon. Steve Brown. He's just on his bio, he's on his autobiography. Mm. Um, uh, he's ex PF guy, and then, yeah, yeah, I've seen he, it. Yeah, yeah. So he's just released a fiction book. He's coming out right. soon. I haven't read the book yet, but I know mm. it's going to be good. Yeah. No, I know I'm going to enjoy it. Yeah. Even if right, Steve turns out to be the worst fiction writer ever. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Which I'm sure he's not right. Yeah. I know the theme of it will still be enjoyable. Well, yeah, I yeah. know that the kinetic actions that are described in there, mm. they'll be realistic. Yeah. You know what I mean? There's another guy who did um, his books are like he's done a trilogy about. Um, there's two guys on similar things actually. Trilogy about like a vigilante, a vigilante group. Mm. Who uh, there's one who's a, it's a trilogy in the books about a, a, a vigilante group. A guy gets hold of a, the UK terror watch list, mm. and they form a vigilante group. Of X. Nice. Yeah. It's not, it's like X SF and then a bunch of X bootnecks and paras and some other mm. some other units, right? And they go basically taking down this terror watch list. Mm. It's so fucking good, mate, mm. because it's you just the way things are being described, you go, I understand that language. Mm. I, this guy yeah. knows how to operate his weapons. This guy knows how a contact would go down. He knows how a confrontation would happen yeah. with weapons or without weapons. He's just so good. Mm. So go, try your hand at it, mate. Yeah, try your hand at I it. Would, yeah, like I said, I started putting, I still got two biographical ones. Um, got your own? Yeah, Tramp Face. So I got, th I got four books. So three okay. of them are Tramp Face series. Two Trump stories. Face. Trump Can I face. Yeah, yeah Tramp Face. So I wrote three before I wrote the autobiography. Um, go on then, go on. So Tramp Face started, was tying into what we've been on about, about needing that buzz or not just necessarily a buzz, but something I'm right for a minute. Um, something. So this was 2014, 2013 going into 2014. Before my last trip to Afghan, we were on UK counterterrorism. So UK based, and then the different roles. One of you is on twenty-four hours call back to camp. The other's on like three hours. So you can only go three hours away from camp. If the pager goes off, you got to come back, get the lads, get the weapons for like a hijack or a UK terror um, related incident. So it was coming up to Christmas this year, and we had a couple weeks off. And I decided traveling abroad on my own during my leave period. So again, not married or anything. So they gave me time off. I'm like, why ain't sitting in the house for two weeks? Or end up like I did in COVID. So I'd start lone wolfing around the world. Trips, trips abroad. abroad. So approaching this Christmas, 
I said, well, I can't go abroad now because I'm on UKCT. We have got two weeks off, but you can't drink when you're on it. And on 24 hours you can, three hours you can. And I can't go abroad, but I've got two weeks at home. So I said, well, I need to do something. And I came up with the idea to go and live homeless um, for a week, but undercover, rather than just doing like politicians and journalists do, and go and talk to all the other homeless people, go, oh, I'm pretending to be homeless. Tell me your story. And they just tell you the story that they want you to know. Well, let's do it undercover. Let's, me and Paul, who I went into the business in copper with, best friend, let's dress like tramps, uh, unshaven, Let's beg every day on the street so people see us in the circles. And that was the rule. We when could do anything a that a homeless saw, person I could do. I've seen a picture of you and a guy, and it looks like you're tramps on the street under a blanket. And I thought, that's fucking weird. For yeah, me. that's tramp face. That's that, is it? That's tramp face, yeah. All right, go on. So, so we're like, yeah, so let's beg every day for our food and money, let's sleep rough, go to all the drop in centres. Swansea, this is the first one. Right, okay. In the city centre. Let's go to all the drop ins, get our faces known, start talking to the other guys, give them the cover story, which was where X Force is. And we're on the streets, which was very believable at the time. I think it was 27% of homeless in Wales were ex-forces. No. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Fucking hell. I didn't know. So I... it was a very believable story. And we're like, and now we can get under the skin of it. We can actually find out what's. Because you all walk past someone begging on the street most days. You get that snapshot. We're like, what do they do for the rest of the day? Where do they sleep? Where do they hang around? Where do they get food from? How... Beneficial is begging. Do they get much money doing that? Turns out they do. What, we even these days with oh, contactless? Yeah. Because, really? We spent no more than two hours each day. What year was this? 2014. See, I'm sceptical here. People carried cash back then. This yeah. is the only thing, mate. I mean, it was still a lot Looking of card back then. Days, We're not talking about the 70s year, mate. <laughs> no, I know, but if you look around these days, mate. Mm. Look in the beggar's pot. There's hardly anything in there. Yeah, but people don't that's a tactic, cash. though, isn't it? Because they don't, we don't, we learn this well. You don't leave all the money in there because everyone thinks you're loaded. Right. So carry Somebody drops story. money in, as soon as they're out of sight, you take that money out and put it in your pocket. You always leave, like, 30 pence in there. I mean, mate, it's I'm done with the <laughs> tactics of this, mate. I'm all over it, man. Right, so go on. Turns out you do earn a lot of money. Go Two on. hours, well, all right, yeah, it was 10 years ago. But he, even then, it was still... There's, there was less people, there was more people carrying cash than there is, I'll give you that, definitely, because it is, although we are on a bit of resurgence, a lot of people are now carrying cash out of stubbornness, because they don't want to see it go. Two hours, no, no more than two hours every day, begging, and again, not saying, oh, we're begging for a laugh, or we did it for charity, so we do a, a post every day from the library, because it's free, so a homeless person could do that, to encourage people to donate who are following the story. <laughs> Sit there with a the bag inside, homeless and hungry. Go on then. T two hours. No more than two hours each day. Cash. Because people were giving us food as well. We didn't even need to spend the cash on food. Cash rich. Because people were going in, <laughs> going in, going, in, going into Tesco's. <laughs> they were going into Tesco's and buying us meal deals. We actually, um, we had a joke. We went in and spoke to the manager. It's like, you want to start giving us some commission on these meal deals because you're cleaning up. Everyone's seeing us going in, buying us a meal and bringing it over. So we had all this food. We were giving food away to the big issue guy because we had so much of it. Um, so it was a massive posi positive thing to see how... Where were, where was your spot? Where in Swansea were you We'd move in? around. One of the key ones was by Tesco's. There's a little lane. The big Tesco's? Yeah. Which, which lane? By Debenhams, by the Quadrant uh, bus station. Yeah. There's a which, really which, tight lane that goes through the car park. Yeah. But the thing is, it's a good spot because it's, it's, it, it's a busy By sort of buses, fair. You Yeah, but a bit further down before you cross over the road to know, Tesco. Yeah. Yeah. But then the other side of it is, it's a hot spot. They all, all the beggars want to go there because they know it's a prime spot. So you have to be quick and get there. Plus the wardens come and move you on. You, you don't get a lot of time. They come and, and shift you on because you don't want you harassing people. But go on in no more than two hours. Loads of food. How much cash we were getting in our in our hat? Two hours. On what day? Well, I'll talk, we'll talk about the Saturday because that was more. But on a on an average weekday. Two hours. Oh, fuck, mate. Um, two hours. I don't know. Twenty quid, thirty quid, forty to fifty quid on average. In just two hours. 
Yeah, that's better than minimum working wage, isn't it? Yeah, minimum, we were like giving it up. We were just going to become tramps, drinking cider all day, bumming around. Just two hours and on a Saturday, uh, 200 pound. Oh my God. Or was it 100? I mean, I have to check the book. I think it was 100. 100 pound, yeah, it must have been 100. 100 pound in two hours on a Saturday in, in a lane. Um, yeah, so the, the, I mean, the positive thing of it was how positive people were towards us, generous. And the argument is, should you be given a couple of drunk tramps cash? Because they're only well, going to spend, well, we this did spend it thing. on booze. Like, what, how were you being? What did you look like? What was your demeanor? Because a lot of tramps you yeah. see, they just We like, didn't look uh, threatening. I mean, Paul's six foot four, right? Skinhead, quite a big <laughs> rugby forward, right? So he did look quite intimidating. I'm not ma- massively big, but I mean, I'm quite short. I'm not a big, huge, intimidating bloke. So we, and what do you mean? We got all our teeth, do you mean? And we haven't got like scars. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, didn't, we didn't look like your average, like mm. smackheads, I'm going to say. Yeah, yeah. True. But we did look homeless, do you mean? We had unshamed beards, scru- really scruffy yeah, clothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so how long did you do this for? A week. So Seven a couple of hours a day? We were on the streets for a, for a week. Seven and, days? Yeah. 24-7? Yeah. Where were you sleeping? Sleeping rough. So the first night down by the hospital, one of the nights in the doorway, and uh, we found like some old pontoons in down the marina stacked up in the car park. We just slept underneath there. Man, what was that like? Did you what was it, what did you discover about the Trump underworld? A lot of them don't sleep on the streets, is the honest truth. Go on. There's a lot of frauds in what you would walk down a high street and think were homeless people aren't homeless. No. They got flats. They got a hostel refuge. Yeah, all right. They're not living in a nice place that they can call home. Well, the people in flats, they probably do. They probably never want to move from there. But they don't want the life. That's what we found out as well that, that we want is a lot of them have got accommodation, but they have been homeless, as in like sleeping on the streets. But there's a community, and it's still there in Swans. You know, and I see it because I've got a bar right in the city center. I see them every day. Because we're right opposite Crackhead, Crackhead Hangout 1. Oh, in that grass area? By Castle, Castle Square, yeah, yeah. yeah. And we're on the thoroughfare to, to Smackhead Hangout 2, which is the station. So they're always going back and forth. And it's, there's a big <laughs> community of them who aren't homeless. But they still hang around in those circles. And they still beg. They still hang around on the streets drinking. They're not actually homeless people. As in, in the sense of, you might say, oh, they haven't got somewhere they could call home. But they've got somewhere to live. They're not sleeping in the doorway every night. Yeah. And London and places like that will surely be different. But if we're talking about Swansea, which I have, we, have, we did go homeless in London as well at one point, I don't think there's a larger proportion of those people that you think and, and say, they will tell you that they're homeless, are actually sleeping on the streets every night. They're not. Yeah. And that is the truth. And I'm not having a go at it. Just saying that's what we saw. A lot of them... We'd hang around with them. And this was the beauty of not going, oh, we're doing this for a laugh. By the end of the week, they were going, hey, it's the army boys. Because Paul had combat trousers on and obviously the cover story. So they recognized us by the end of the week and they were just talking to us normally. Mm. So by doing that, we got these stories. They wouldn't tell you if you went up, oh, there you go, mate, there's a meal deal. Oh, what's the score? What's the story, mate? Yeah, I've been out all week. I mean, I'm homeless. And they're not going to tell you that because they want help off you. They tell us because they thought we were the same. Hmm? You wrote three books about this. Yeah, the first one we did it in Swansea, so a week did it in a week in Swansea, and then it was great success. Raised five grand for charity from the online posts. So I want to do it again next year. But we, what were you doing with the money that you got in your pots? We went. It all went to Shelter Cymru and Safa. Right. Okay. So it was all documented. <laughs> Not on it documented. We did spend anything that we did spend to sustain ourselves because that was the whole point of it we paid back in at the end of the week. Right. So we made a note, all right, we spent four quid on a flag and a cider today, which we were, we were drinking. Um, <laughs> were you getting, getting pissed here? Yeah, oh yeah, hammered some of the nights. <laughs> hammered. Quality. Yeah. Like oh, I guess what we on the James English podcast, because he did one, and I was like, yours is quite serious, and I mean, and, and like, honourable. I said, we just got on the piss for a week without going home. Oh, you did James English? <laughs> yeah. Oh, a few nice. weeks ago, yeah. Yeah. Um, because, yeah, he did a homeless thing. I said, yeah, was, yours is serious. We just got on the lash for a week. Yeah. And just, just didn't go home until the end of it. Um, so, yeah, we recorded that and paid that back in uh, at the end of it. We, so the second year, we were like, well, let's do it again. But we can't do the same thing because 
people are going to be like, I'm not giving you money for that. You did it last year. You already proved it. Well, let's up the ante. So the second year, we went to Calais, the migrant camp. Oh, my God. So I remember we had we had a meeting in Weatherspoons. That was like our HQ. Two meals for a fiver each and a couple of pints. And I was like, what are we going to do this year then? And Paul just pulled out this video of the migrant Calais jungle camp. Oh, my God. And I was like, yes. That is dangerous. So we went and lived there for a week on the second one with an aim of trying to get back on a lorry, <clears throat> right? Which is a lot harder than you'd actually think. So we didn't end up getting on the back of a lorry. We got tear gassed, like going to watch them try to do it, get over the fences and just lobbing tear gases, bombs at us. So we did that second year. That's a book as well, Tramface Calais. Third year then, we hitchhiked. So same rules as the first one, right? We're going homeless, we sleep rough, we've got a bag. Uh, we can't do anything that a tramp couldn't do, but let's hitchhike. So we started off in Swansea, thumb out on Fabian Way. First person, if any, that stops to pick us up. All right, lads, where are you going? Where are you going? Oh, well, I'm off to Leeds. <laughs> Leeds it is then. <laughs> and do that for seven days. Quality. Hitchhike every day, wherever the first person that picks us up is going, we'll go there, get out, go homeless for the night. And then do the same the next day. Uh, so that, that was just, that was the funniest one. It's just the characters we met. It's just brilliant. And like from the start, the first guy that picked us up, his car broke down on the, on the M4, oh. pulled over. And I was like, all right, he was ex-naval guy, actually, ex-naval officer who's now in IT, driving back to Leeds. We didn't go to Leeds in the end because his car broke down. I'm like, oh, all right, Steve, what, what, what kind of uh, cover have you got? He sort of looked sideways at me. I was like, you haven't got any breakdown cover of you? He's like, nope. But I had, with my bank, cover if I'm in anybody else's car. So it turned out from him giving us a lift to him being recovered from my <laughs> breakdown cover with my bank. And by the time that all got sorted, we, it was getting late. We like, just drop us in Cardiff, mate. What so, year did you do that one? So that was 2016. Oh, this is quality stuff. Yeah. And then the fourth one. But the Cali one. Sorry, the Cali one. What was your cover story there? Because you what? Yeah, brilliant. Paul came up with this. And when he said it to me, I was like, there is no chance in hell anyone's going to buy this. And it turned out to be genius. And the one, we actually had to roll it out a couple of times to charity workers who were suspicious of us there. Because obviously we didn't look like 100% of the other people there. So we knew we were going to get questioned of hanging around in these camps and going, we were going to the food aid places to get mm. free food. And they're just like looking at us going, well, who are you? Cover story was, we were French Foreign Legion, deserters. <laughs> so that was my, that was my reaction when he told me. I was like, no chance. Oh, fuck yeah. French Foreign Legion, deserters. We jumped, we jumped the wall. It was even more elaborate if we went all the way back, which we didn't have to roll out. We were, we were born in Hong Kong to Welsh and Irish parents. They died. You brothers, yeah. In, not you, in real life, were, no. Yeah, but, but for the in, cover story, In you the brothers. cover story, yeah. He's six foot nine. Six foot four. Okay, right. Yeah. yeah. How old are you? I mean, you get into some, it's six foot four. I don't think that was the most unbelievable thing about this story, the fact that he was taller than me. <laughs> it's like two two brothers. I think, really yeah, right? I think there was more holes to pick in the story <laughs> rather than him being a bit taller. <laughs> Go on. That wasn't the first thing they picked up on. So we, yeah, we left on Pants and died. We left Hong Kong, joined the Legion, decided we didn't like it. And we researched it. There was one in Paris. There's a camp on the outskirts of Paris, Legion. We jumped the wall. And of course, we can't go back to Hong Kong. UK is the first, the closest one. And of course, we can't get to the UK because we didn't join the Legion. It take all your paperwork off you. You get a new identity. So we jumped the wall. We got no papers. We're trying to get back to the UK, but until we can get word to the government, we're stuck living homeless in, in and around Calais. And I've got it on a body cam of this story getting rolled out to the charity workers who, who challenged us. They thought we were from uh, a shady organization. You mentioned like No Borders thing earlier, but there's one called No Borders who smuggle people across borders yeah. actively. They thought we were part of them recruiting people. And we were like, no, 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 we're a lot foreign legion. And they, they sort of bought it the first day. We came back the second day, rolled it out again. There's this young French lad there. And he was like, of course, they desert us. Of course, they've got no papers. Because it's on the camera. The girl is going, well, why don't you go to the embassy? We said, we can't go to the embassy. Well, there is no embassy in Calais. There isn't like a British embassy. It's a tiny little town. 
She was like, well, Paris. He said, well, we can't go back to Paris. We've just fled from there. We were on the run. We can't just turn up at the embassy in Paris. And she's like, oh, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And the guy was like, yeah, of course. Come and eat, guys. Of course, they, they desert us. They need looking after. So I was like, it turned out to be rolled it out. And it's on camera, rolling it out. And they... They went for it. Lack Don't get me wrong. Like the, we befriended a lot of Syrian refugees and slept. We slept with them on a church doorstep. Got photos of us like piggy in the middle with the blankets. We rolled out a story to them and like what their leader, Sally, really educated guy, spoke fluent English and everything. He was just like, yeah, 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 lads. I don't really believe you, but we, we got on with him. We stayed with him a few days and we had a laugh and everything. He was like, I don't quite believe you, but. Mm. We, we trust you enough to to have you in the camp and be a, being around us. But so Leeds, Calais, uh, uh, not Leeds, not Leeds, Swansea, Calais, Calais then hitchhike all around the UK. Yeah, what was the fourth one? Fourth one. We cycled Swansea to London over the course of five days. So we cycled Swansea to Cardiff, locked the bikes up at the police station, which we prearranged. Went homeless under the same conditions for the night. Next day, bear again, sleeping rough. Got the bikes. Cardiff to Bristol, got out, went home, uh, locked up, went homeless. Swindon, Oxford, Reading, then got to London. So we'd been cycl cycling in between living homeless for five days, all the way to London. Locked the bikes up in London, went two nights homeless in the capital. And on the final morning, it was the day of the London Marathon, which we'd been entered into through the charity. No way. We rolled out of a bush, put our daps on and ran the marathon. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. And he done, so these are separate books? That the fourth one isn't a book yet. That's one of the ones that I've got. A, I've started writing it, but I got one. So the first three are books released, published. So I've got to get the fourth one done. And then the fifth one was because we did that marathon one and we raised 10 grand charity doing it because it was, I mean, cycling, the worst preparation ever for a marathon. Yeah. You ask someone, what's the worst prep you can do? Well, be cycling every day on roads and then with kit as well, because we had sleeping bags and stuff to sleep in the streets. And then living rough and eating crap, whatever people were giving us for five days, seven days. Um, and then running the marathon. And we were on such a high, we were just like, how can we top this? We're gonna have to go homeless on the moon or, I mean, how are we gonna do it? And then we had a gap year, because we, we just couldn't think of something of how to top it. And then Paul again came up with a, trump card he was like well the last time we went to calais he said we didn't achieve the goal of getting smuggling back into the uk we went and lived there and saw all that and that was amazing enough anyway but we didn't get across the border we didn't we didn't beat border force and then he got another video out of the dinghies and the boats crossing oh, the channel God. it was massively topical which it is now and always will be well hopefully not but probably will be it had been a spike. It was a summer offensive or something. <laughs> it was loads of them. <laughs> yeah, so it was something that happened to make it even more, <laughs> yeah. even more topical. And he was like, well, they're coming across in these boats. They're doing it. How hard or easy is it? So he said, well, let's go back to France. We went to Paris first. So we flew into Paris. I technically still haven't left France since that champ face trip because we flew in on our passports yeah. and came back on a rubber dinghy <laughs> we did do it did you so we went homeless in paris for um a few nights four four nights or something went to a yellow vest protest got tear gas got a vid cracking video of that of me getting cs gassed by the french police riot police lived in some of the migrant camps around the capital and insane they like stage imposts for the ones going migrating further north yeah. to get across and the problems with that is they know it's a staging post so it's in even more of a shit state because they know they're not staying there for very mm -hmm. long rats i got videos of us with rats running around our feet and everything so we did paris went back to calais to see how much it had changed since we were there last <laughs> and then the finale was our friend drove over on the ferry in a van with a dinghy and a small engine in the back didn't get rumbled but I, any searches or anything we met him on the coast of northern france we'd we'd wrecked a route into the we hadn't even been to look at it ourselves on the ground we got on google maps and gone there's a slipway into the channel there let's go there and launch the boat met us went to the slipway inflated it in the dead of night 
and set off across channel. And just got back in. Got across four and a half hours, undetected, straight across, boom, hit the beach near Folkestone. Holy <laughs> shit! <laughs> so technically, oh I still haven't God. left France. I haven't checked out of France uh, since that trip. When was that? That was 2019. So again, just oh the year before God. going into COVID. Back, and you were still serving then? Still serving. What, was the, what were the military saying about that? Well, it obviously caused us hurt because we got arrested eventually. So we hit the beach and high fives, of course, undetected, mission accomplished. Now, if you're a migrant, you leg it or you go and hand yourself in, whatever your preferred option is. Of course, we had a boat that our friend needed to come and it was his boat, an engine, <laughs> so we couldn't just leg it. Yeah. So he's gone back across on the ferry in the van. He couldn't get down to the beach, which happened to be a shingle beach as well. So it was like a travelator because it was only a, a pedestrian promenade. Yeah. So he had to park at the top of the hill. He was, he borrowed a, a wheelbarrow off some council landscapers. So he was doing shuttle runs up and down to get the kit from us. So we were there for over an hour, pack it up. It was light by this point as well. Sun had come up. So of course, houses facing this beach are like, two guys have just washed up near Dover on a dinghy. Yeah, police you might want to come and have a look at this. And they did. Police turned up, border force turned up, customs turned up. National Crime Agency then turn up. Oh, we no. get arrested on suspicion of human trafficking. And it's quite funny, actually. You could, um, tell a story about the, the first two bobbies who turned up. I'm one, conscious you got to train in 16 minutes. By the way. Is it? Yeah. yeah. Um, Go on. Me and catch a later one, mate. If How long is a later one? How much later is a later crack one? Crack on. I think it was... It just, I then just get home later, I think it is. Quick look. I think, it, I think it's like an hour or something later. Oh, no, 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 no. Let's, no, no, no. Don't wait sure. another hour, mate. Don't wait another hour. No? Well, you cut it off on the story now, though. Well, go on, you carry on. See how you get on. <laughs> <laughs> the train station only five minutes away. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that story there's two coppers turned up. One was ex-army. So I got my combat jacket on now with my flash on it, my power wings. Yeah. It was like the old green one. And I had jeans on. I was like, I was like Rodney from Only Fools and Horses. And he's like, oh, yeah. And he didn't believe... We were pissing about with him. He was like, what are you doing, lads? Just out on the boat for a day. What, from fucking South Wales? Yeah, we got a bit lost, mate. And then he's like, all right, yeah, yeah. So you're in the Marines and the Paras, are you? I was in the Army. How does that work? I went, well, if you're in the Army, mate, you know that, no, I'm a Royal Marine Commando and I'm parachute trained. That isn't the parachute regiment cap badge. Yeah. All right, yeah, blah, blah. What's your service number? Gave it to him. And then he was like, go on then. What's the four marksmanship principles? Oh, God. I was like, this guy sounds like a fucking yeah. I was like, right. Oh, I was like, oh, weapon must point naturally at the target, position, and hold must be firm. So, what the weapon, sight, picture, sight line must be correct. And then I went, oh, I'm stuck on the fourth one, but you were in the army. You can tell me, can you? And he didn't know it himself. Oh, my God. So, yeah, pissing about with them. And, yeah, got eventually got arrested on suspicion of human trafficking. Released because we weren't actually smuggling migrants across the channel. Um, so that'd be the fifth book. Yeah. Quality. Mm. Quality. Um, fucking hell. That's dangerous going to come in. Mm. No. Yeah. They don't have any dodgy times. And being ex military, because if they got wind of who we were, because we had a Facebook page to raise money for the charity, mm. fucking Royal Marine and an ex Royal Engineer, who Paul was, living in pff, ISIS or any. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And also the, the the criminal gangs who were smuggling them across, they're like, oh, these two military guys cutting about the camp, asking questions and yeah. trying to find out what we're up to. Proper dodgy. Sort them out. So yeah, it was. It blew up to to the to navy. One of your colour sergeants just been arrested for human trafficking so you across hadn't cleared it, no. the channel. Hmm? You hadn't cleared it. Well, this was how lucky it was. Boom, they boot the door in of CGRM, Commandant General Royal Marines. One of your Marines, Marines have been caught, blah, blah, blah. So he's, he's obviously you now like, shit, really? Luckily, his bag man had only just moved into the job, was my training officer in my... Uh, he'd only moved out of that post a few weeks before. So he was like, hang on a minute. It, it isn't. It's Westies. He's doing tramp face. He, I know all about it. Luckily, the CEO of... I was CLR at the time. CEO had read two of my books by this point. So again, he's, oh, yeah, right. the two of the tramp fist books. So he was like, it's Westies. Yeah. All right. We, we do need to ask some questions, but he ain't smuggling people across the channel. It's yeah. Charity oh, event. Mate, on that note, how can people find your books? Amazon, 
Tramp Face, the uh, autobiographies. <laughs> It's a brilliant name, isn't it? When we first got there, we were like, we might have to fuck rethink that one. Is that a bit politically incorrect? We're like, ah, bollocks to it. Yeah. Um, and the autobiography is Never Above, Never Below. LG West is the author name. That is my name, Lee. LG West. Lee West. LG um, West. LG West. Like HG Wells, but LG West. It is, like C.S. Lewis and yeah, all of them. Get that fiction done. Yeah, I will. Get I will at done, some mate. point. Yeah. Be a reader. Be a pleasure, man. Yeah. Be a pleasure. So, books. Amazon, and then people, you're on X, I know you're on X, Lee West. I'm on X, yeah, Lee West, Royal Marine, LW, YouTube, Wolf of the World, got a YouTube channel now, that blew up after I did the story, and Jim went on James English and everything, the GB News on GB News talking about the channel, Oh yeah. the thingy, nice. uh, you know, it was years ago, only now they got hold of it, and they were like, it's a unique experience, man, yeah, yeah, unique and like experience. I said, topical, very, up happy as well. very topical, and the fact that we pulled the pants down of Border Force, yeah, the salty sea dog, when, we were stood there, and like the deflated dinghy there, he was like big grey BS. He was like, right, hang on a minute. You've just come from northern France on that. <laughs> and we were like, yeah. He was like, it's four seven sea state out there, lads. We're not even sending our boats out, our patrol boats. That's <laughs> that's how you got away with it. It's too rough for the border force. And we were like, yeah. Okay. No biggie. Quality. Mate, it's been a pleasure. Cheers for your time. Yeah, and, cheers, um, man. Yeah, I'll see you in the copper bar next time yeah, I'm down. Yeah, it should be down. next couple of months. Yeah. Definitely be in there. Gleeman. Sorry.